Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And it's the one you've all been waiting for, folks. Yes, it's the trial court's decision in Epic versus Apple. But before we talk about it, let's take a trip in the Wayback Machine to talk to a pretty smart fellow from a few months ago. I think the judge rightfully thinks that Epic's theory goes too far. I think they are unlikely to give them a win on the monopoly question. As I've mentioned earlier in the series, if this access is monopolistic, then you've got all sorts of problems with every walled garden on earth. I think that she is likely to deny them that, but who knows? And then I think that she might just want to give Epic a little bit of a win uh, because of what she has seen from Apple and what Epic has been able to prove about how Apple interacts with its developers and say that those anti-steering rules have to be modified, have to go, probably with Apple and Epic sitting at the table for how that looks. So if you've been in virtual legality with us since at least the making of that video, then you're probably pretty familiar with what the decision actually wound up being. If you haven't been with us for that whole time, welcome to the 54th video of an antitrust epic, The Playlist, or if you're just following along with the trial itself, the 18th video of the epic versus Apple, just the trial playlist. And boy, oh boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. You can already see the time that this video is taken before I've even finished it. So I bet it's a doozy, but that's because the judge decided to write about 180 pages on this particular topic. I'm going to do my best to summarize for you. We're going to go through it at length as we do here in virtual legality. But unfortunately, one of the things that happened as a result of such a kind of amorphous, big blob-like decision is that people seem to have gotten the wrong idea as to what happened here. Let's take a look at a couple of the headlines. Verge, Apple must allow other forms of in-app purchases, rules judge in Epic versus Apple. That's wrong. How about CNBC? Apple can no longer force developers to use in-app purchasing. Also wrong. Back to the Verge. The Epic versus Apple ruling could put a serious dent in Apple's $19 billion app store business. Now, that's a reasonable minds may differ kind of statement, but I doubt it. How about Ars Technica? Well, how about this giant ad on Ars Technica? Major win for Epic Games. Apple has 90 days to open up app store payments. Hmm, not quite, but we're getting closer. GameSpot. Epic Games case judge says Apple must allow alternative payment methods on App Store. That's not right at all. And I gave quotes to them. Speaking with GameSpot, attorney Richard Hogue said, on preliminary review, it appears to be a near total victory for Apple. And yet the headline went a little far afield. Kotaku, Epic wins big Fortnite lawsuit against Apple. Judge rules Apple cannot require in-app transactions to go through the App Store. Again, not true. How about IGN? Hey, IGN did a great job with their headline. Epic versus Apple. Judge rules Apple must allow developers to direct app users to outside payment options. And we're going to talk about what that means and why the other headlines are wrong, but we have to dive into them a little bit. Let's go back to that Verge article about $19 billion in app store business. What do they think is happening here? Well, in the first paragraph of the story, we see it's a decision that cuts right to the heart of the roughly $19 billion a year the App Store brings in for Apple. Because at the end of the day, the App Store makes most of its money off in-app purchases inside free-to-download games. Sounds to me like they think the 30% that Apple takes off of those purchases is being challenged in some fashion. Ars Technica makes it even clearer in other words, Epic Games' effort to add Epic-specific payment links inside the free-to-play game Fortnite and thus duck out of paying Apple's 30% fee on in-app transactions can now happen. This is just misinformation, folks. You can flag this on Twitter if you like. That's entirely not what has happened here. But why do I say that? And why do I say that with such strength of feeling? Well, if you were here in virtual legality in the last couple of weeks, you saw we did an article on South Korea adopting a law that says... Apple and Google have to allow for other payment processing services outside of in-app payment processing or whatever Google winds up calling it. And I said in that video that a lot of these journalists, a lot of these outlets were missing the forest for the trees because while that might be true, there is nothing in such a rule that suggests that Apple doesn't still get its right to a commission. In fact, Apple has a contract specifically covering its 30%. It says here, 
for sales of licensed applications to end users, which includes both buying games out of the box and in-app payments, Apple shall be entitled to a commission equal to 30% of all prices payable by each end user. It's the full sentence, full stop. Not money that comes through our processing, not other rules associated with it. If you get paid for something that got sold on our platform, then you owe us 30%. Now, some of you might say, well, in this multi-platform context, if Epic sends you off site and you buy it over there, yes, Apple currently doesn't have a claim on that by virtue of the way its app review guidelines work. They basically absolve themselves of that. But right now, as it stands, simply using a third-party processor doesn't get you out of owing Apple the 30%. Before we get into the actual language in the court case on all manner of different issues and why I say Apple is basically the full winner of this with one important exception, let's drag out some quotes that the court itself said in this 185-page document so that we can keep them highlighted in our minds when we look at other outlets talking about this particular decision. Under all models, Apple would be entitled to a commission or licensing fee even if IAP was optional. Now, it's important to distinguish here. The court, faced with the decision of calling your in-app processing or your in-app products uh, IAP, went with processing for IAP. So they're talking about the entire processing concept, not just the purchases that you might make, where you or I might use IAP to suggest the shoes or the V-Bucks that you get in Fortnite or otherwise. No, IAP is the processing service that Apple affords to its developers. So they say under all models, Apple would be entitled to a commissioner licensing fee, even if you don't use their processing. Apple is entitled to license its intellectual property for a fee and to guard its intellectual property from uncompensated use by others. Even in the absence of IAP, of processing by Apple, Apple could still charge a commission on developers. It would simply be more difficult for Apple to collect that commission. While the court finds no basis for the specific rate chosen by Apple, i.e. the 30% rate, based on the record, the court still concludes that Apple is entitled to some compensation for use of its intellectual property to the extent Epic Games suggests that Apple received nothing from in-app purchases made on its platform. Such a remedy is inconsistent with prevailing intellectual property law, which it should come as no surprise to you now having gone through this introduction to this video that the court doesn't determine that Epic and other developers don't owe Apple any money just by virtue of sending their people off-site or doing other things that the court is going to allow by virtue of its decision-making. So keep those in mind. Keep the headlines in mind because basically Apple won on virtually every aspect of the lawsuit that Epic brought with the exception of the anti-steering rules that I highlighted in that video clip earlier in this video and that we talked about at length throughout this playlist. It was clear during the trial that the court wasn't very enthused about a whole host of Apple's business practices, but in particular thought that there was a weakness in argument that Apple was defending in prohibiting developers from telling folks that they can buy these particular things off-site, elsewhere. And so the court has taken a step against those anti-steering rules. We'll see what that step is as we dive into 185 pages of material. Now, if you want to do some homework at home before we start up on this, I do want to note, this will be linked in the description of the video, there's four or five pages at the end of this document that the judge has actually put forth with kind of an outline format to help you follow along. We're not going to be covering every section in this decision because I actually think that there's some extraneous language and some kind of navel gazing and pondering, which I don't blame a judge for exactly, uh, but isn't super useful to actually arriving at a merits decision. But you can use that document at the end. You could print out those four or five pages to go over everything that we're about to go over. Now, the decision itself is divided into two parts. Not that unusual. The first is the factual findings. The court here is the finder of fact. And so they get to determine what is the reality here. They've listened to all the testimony. They've listened to the pleadings. They've had both parties submit all manner of documents to them. They get to decide this is true, this is false, this is true, this is false. They get those findings of fact. And then in the second part of the decision, they apply those facts to what they view as the law. If this were a jury trial, the finder of fact would be the jury. The applicant of the law would be the judge here. It's a bench trial. The judge performs both functions, which is why you get a very, very long document, though I would still see it a little shorter. 
Let's take a look at what the judge said in her introduction. Broadly speaking, Epic Games claimed that Apple is an antitrust monopolist over one, Apple's own system of distributing apps on Apple's own devices in the App Store, and two, Apple's own system of collecting payments and commissions of purchases made on Apple's own devices in the App Store. The court disagrees with both parties' definition of the relevant market. Ultimately, after evaluating the trial evidence, the court finds that the relevant market here is digital mobile gaming transactions, not gaming generally, and not Apple's own internal operating systems related to the App Store. Remember, we talked about this early in the series, but Apple wants the definition of the relevant market to be huge because they couldn't possibly control it, and Epic wants it to be very narrow. They want it to just be things that operate on iOS because if it's that narrow, you're a natural monopolist. Or the example I gave earlier in the series is I'm a natural monopolist provider of virtual legality episodes. I'm the only one that does it. And so, yes, I monopolize that market if you make that relevant market that narrow. Here, the court declines both definitions of relevant market offered by Apple as everything under the sun and Epic as just the things on the iOS and says instead, digital mobile gaming transactions is where the market lives. And we'll see a little bit how the court arrives at that decision, but it's important because in arriving at that market, Apple doesn't hit certain important thresholds of control that would win Epic the case when you're talking about things like monopolistic activity. Given the trial record, the court cannot ultimately conclude that Apple is a monopolist under either federal or state antitrust laws. While the court finds that Apple enjoys considerable market share of over 55% and extraordinarily high profit margins, these factors alone do not show antitrust conduct. Success is not illegal, which is a concept you've heard here in virtual legality as applied to the Sherman Antitrust Act. The court does not find that it is impossible only that Epic Games failed in its burden to demonstrate Apple is an illegal monopolist. Now, this is an important place to take an aside. One of the things you'll note as we go through this is that the judge here is actually fairly antagonistic towards both parties. There's a certain underlying tone of not being thrilled about how either side has decided to conduct business here. With respect to Epic, most specifically on their decision to breach the contract and have a big marketing hoopla and overreach with their claims against Apple, which is one of the things we've talked about in this series. With respect to Apple, she has complaints about what I think you or I or any other consumer generally has complaints about Apple in respect of. Things like arbitrariness, lack of transparency, Apple just deciding to do whatever it wants, changing the rules willy-nilly. There is a clear through line in this decision of a judge that doesn't much care for Apple. And if you want to read into it, a subtext that says Epic could have done a better job and the judge is kind of upset that Epic didn't do that better job. Continuing with the introduction, nonetheless, the trial did show that Apple is engaging in anti-competitive conduct under California's competition laws. And we're going to be talking about that pretty extensively. It's the one area where Epic really did win something. It is also by far the most tortured line of logic in this entire decision. Not really the judge's fault. California unfair competition laws are notoriously let's call it flexible. And so the judge basically uses that flexibility to do what she wanted to do as evidence at the trial, which is to hit these anti-steering rules, even though she's not going to find a problem with the Sherman Antitrust Act or federal antitrust law or even California antitrust law on its baseline. Instead, she says the court concludes that Apple's anti-steering provisions hide critical information from consumers and illegally stifle consumer choice. When coupled with Apple's incipient antitrust violations, these anti-steering provisions are anti-competitive and a nationwide remedy to eliminate those provisions is warranted. So a lot of stuff happening there. But one we will see is that Epic's win is based not on federal law, but on California law and California law of a predominantly equitable nature, meaning that it's a lot of hand-waving and decision-making and judgment on the part of the court rather than black letter law, rather than rulings and precedents and things along those lines. Nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of law that gets done on an equitable basis, but it does make it a little bit more susceptible to appeal. Apple will undoubtedly appeal that portion of the ruling here, at least to suggest that it shouldn't apply outside of California. And I would probably back them up on that. It's a little unusual to apply unfair competition laws in California to the entire country. But they will complain about all of the reasoning here. Epic will undoubtedly appeal 
the rest of this decision. And the judge knows this. The judge wrote a 180-page document because she knows that the Court of Appeals is going to be taking a look at this and is undoubtedly going to do whatever they want. And she wanted to have her thought process on the record. So we start with part one, findings of fact. We're going to be skipping over large sections of this. I am assuming that if you're here in virtual legality with me, you know a little bit uh, about Fortnite, about Epic, about the App Store, about the iPhone, iOS, everything else. We're going to cover some of the things that the judge says here because she takes a few cracks at both sides. And that's interesting to follow. But for the most part, we're not going to be diving deep into the history of Epic or the history of Apple. It says, to determine the relevant market, the court must first understand the industry and the markets in that industry. This is a heavily factual inquiry, right? Facts and circumstances. You can't guess as to what a judge is going to say the market is, which is one of the big problems with antitrust law is because that market definition is so important. One of the things I said in however many episodes of virtual legality in this series is that I can't deign to guess where the judge will finish off on this. I can tell you where precedent would suggest she should, but she could have decided a completely different market And a lot of that will be honored because she's gone through the process of doing the factual inquiry and the Court of Appeals is going to be reluctant in most instances to kind of second guess the trial court on that. So here we're talking about Fortnite game modes. How does Fortnite work? Key features of Fortnite. More Fortnite, Fortnite stuff. And then we arrive at page 12. Although Epic Games claims that it would not have a viable way of monetizing Fortnite without being able to sell in-app content, the record shows it monetizes Fortnite in nine other ways. So again, Epic is claiming here that Apple has a monopoly over access to their store, has a monopoly over distribution of things within their store, and they can't get enough money out of Fortnite because of those things. One of the things the court finds here is that Epic has a billion ways to make money off of Fortnite. I found this to be pretty interesting. Two, she says, are internal to the game. First is Fortnite Crew, which is their subscription service. Second is an upfront fee to play Save the World, which I don't think is actually that analogous to playing Fortnite as we might think of Fortnite, Battle Royale, but it is in fact a way Epic has made money off of this intellectual property. The remaining seven, she says, are external, typically in the form of redeemable codes sold through traditional retail and online stores, in-game advertising, cross promotions, third parties with promotional codes, hardware bundle agreements, and partners with redeemable codes. All that stuff you see in Fortnite, Well, somebody probably paid to get Space Jam featured in Fortnite. Epic or someone else might have paid to get Fortnite shoes put in with their box of shoes or anything else that you might imagine. And and Epic has done a great job of kind of delivering on this new market of third-party advertising within Fortnite as a concept. The more cynically minded among us might think that that's the purpose of the metaverse. But either way, Fortnite has been very successful in doing those kinds of things. doesn't really make... Apple's case for them, because if Fortnite's money is coming through in-app content, it still shouldn't just be foreclosed to them because they have these other methodologies. But it's interesting to see how the court's dealing with the question. Generally, plaintiff, that's Epic Games to you and I, must pay 30% across most platforms. Indeed, for example, Epic Games has agreed to such a rate on all Fortnite transactions via the Microsoft Xbox Store, the PlayStation Store, the Nintendo eShop, and Google Play. Epic Games has also agreed to extra payments for certain platform holders above and beyond the standard 30% commission rate. For example, for all Fortnite transactions via the PlayStation Store, Epic Games agreed to make additional payments to Sony above this commission rate based on the amount of time that PlayStation users play Fortnite cross-platform. And in fact, we did a video on that. That was a really interesting thing to come out of the early days of Discovery in that trial case. You can check that out as part of the series. But the court here is again establishing that At least in some important respects, Epic's claim against Apple specifically, a little bit disingenuous because they're paying these amounts to everybody else under the sun. So you start to get a feel for the judge not being thrilled with whole large aspects of this case. That said, despite the staggering number of iOS Fortnite players, the vast majority of Epic Games' Fortnite revenue, 93%, is generated on non-iOS platforms. Why are we here? Why are we talking about this specific issue? And The more cynically minded among us, again, could say, well, Epic's got a partnership with Sony. They like to have a close relationship with Xbox, et cetera, et cetera. Epic Games acknowledged that its commission in the Epic Games Store context is not merely a payment processing fee, which is what they accused Apple of having. The 12% fee is principally for access to Epic Games' customers, but also is intended to cover all of Epic Games' variable operating costs associated with selling incremental games to customers. Again, this is one of those areas where you say Epic is overreaching. 
in respect to the Coalition for App Fairness, everything else that Epic did, they wanted to say Apple only deserves 2 to 3% that Stripe or PayPal or whoever gets. And yet we run the Epic Game Store that takes a 12% cut for some reason. And the judge properly calls them out and says, well, your 12% is for something like access to your customers. And Apple has a whole lot of customers to give access to. But she also notes that 12% might be trying to undercut the market in a fashion that won't ultimately wind up being profitable. By charging 12% commission, the Epic Game Store will not be profitable for at least several years. In short, the Epic Game Store has front-loaded its marketing and user acquisition costs to gain market share. While Epic Games now says it expects the Epic Game Store to become profitable by 2023, the store's projected revenue from prior years has proven overly optimistic. It's a little subtweeting here in the legal landscape. Okay, Epic, you're going to make money on this, sure. Your other numbers from all the other reports that were submitted to us, a little rosy. So we'll see when you wind up making money from all this. Then we talk about the contract itself with Apple. In 2010, Epic Games agreed to and signed a Developer Product Licensing Agreement, a DPLA, with Apple. Since 2010, there has been no material change in the terms of Epic Games' agreements with Apple, nor in Apple's business design. This is another thing that we raised during the trial and earlier in the series, which is this is an unusual case because one of the things that's usually an inciting event to an antitrust action is one or the other party doing something new. Apple being in a contract with Epic and then jacking their prices from 30 to 50. Okay, that usually gets people's eyebrows raised and brings a lawsuit with it. Here, Apple was just humming along, doing whatever it was doing, hadn't really changed anything. Epic was a partner of theirs, really. Epic had appeared on Apple's stage and at their conferences, and then Apple got sued. So one of the things that comes up here is that Apple didn't change course, and that's going to prove pretty problematic for a number of areas of Epic's case. We continue on with a little bit more history, and then we arrive at Project Liberty. They sure do think strongly of themselves over at Epic. At the end of 2019, Tim Sweeney conceived of a plan called Project Liberty, which was a highly choreographed attack on Apple and Google Inc. The record reveals two primary reasons motivating the action. First and foremost, as we've said extensively here in virtual legality, Epic Games seeks a systematic change which would result in tremendous monetary gain and wealth. Court, as a finding of fact, says, look, what Epic's asking for will make it a fortune. And that shouldn't be ignored, regardless of what Tim Sweeney or Epic Games says about the little guy at all. Second, Project Liberty is a mechanism to challenge the policies and practices of Apple and Google, which are an impediment to Mr. Sweeney's vision of the oncoming metaverse. They want to make a lot of money, and they want to have interoperability that allows them to continue this metaverse push. Judge talks a lot more about Project Liberty. Project Liberty included a public narrative and marketing plan. Epic Games recognized that it was not sympathetic, and that if Apple and Google blocked consumers from accessing the app, sentiment will trend negative towards Epic. To these ends, Epic Games wanted to get players, media, and industry on Epic's side by creating a narrative that we are benevolent and at the same time make Apple out to be the bad guys. While Epic Games was willing to wage war against Apple and Google, it was not so inclined to crusade against the console platform owners, namely Nintendo with their Switch, Microsoft, Xbox, and Sony PlayStation. Epic Games therefore planned to warn these console partners in advance about an upcoming pricing change for V-Bucks and to reassure them that they were not next on Epic Games' list. Project Liberty required extensive planning and testing. Specialized engineers and an in-house information security team attempted to hack the code to ensure that Apple could not reveal the intent of the hotfix when it was submitted. Epic Games also used analytics to determine the number of players that would receive the hotfix once triggered. Here the judge is laying the foundations for Project Liberty, not benign. Epic knew what it was doing, had internal communications about the fact that Apple and Google were very likely to take Fortnite down, if not to sue them directly. And it was all coordinated and was not kind of an accidental footfall that might otherwise get a little bit of beneficent rule from the judge. Now we move on to Apple. We get the relevant history of the iOS and iOS devices, the early years, app developers generally, Epic Games, et cetera, et cetera. And then we start talking about the DPLA. Remember, the main contract that you enter into with Apple if you're going to develop games for them. Relevant here, 
The DPLA details programming requirements, which the court outlines first and establishes payment terms, which the court discusses second. With respect to programming, developers are required to certify that they will comply with the terms of the agreement. Always a good thing. Use the software in a manner consistent with Apple's legal rights. Don't steal our stuff. Create apps for Apple's products, which could only be distributed through the App Store. Make it specifically for us. Submit proposed apps for review to ensure they were properly documented and did not contravene the program requirements. We get another bite at the apple, if you will. Configure apps to use IAP, again, that's the processing, when the purchases are subject to the commission, and agree not to attempt to hide, misrepresent, or obscure any features, content, services, or functionality, which is what's really going to nail Epic to the wall on their breach here. In 2010, Apple also created the app guidelines, which are more fully discussed below. As a corollary to section 3.3.3 of the DPLA, section 3.1.1, of the app guidelines was the clearest articulation of the anti-steering provision with respect to in-app purchases. And this is important because remember, this is going to be where Epic wins. It reads, if you want to unlock features or functionality within your app, by way of example, subscriptions, in-game currencies, game levels, access to premium content, or unlocking a full version, you must use in-app purchase. Apps may not use their own mechanisms to unlock content or functionality, such as license keys, augmented reality markers, QR codes, etc. Apps and their metadata may not include buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. Apple had a rule in 3.1.1 that said, within your app, you can't put a notification or a link or a button that sends people outside of the iPhone environment to purchase something. And this was part and parcel to one of the exceptions that Apple has with respect to multi-platform games like Fortnite that says you can sell stuff elsewhere. We're not going to have a parity pricing clause. We're not going to do all these other things that some others might. And you can have people buy things over there and then use them over here. But what you can't do is you can't advertise that fact in this particular space. Judge is going to have a problem with that as we surmised when we listened to the trial. Continuing, we see reference to what we talked about earlier in the video. Apple shall be entitled to a commission equal to 30% of all prices payable by each end user, which is not dependent on having Apple collect that money through a processor. This is really where everybody is getting tripped up when we're discussing this, even though those court quotes that we spoke about earlier in the video are out there for all to see in black and white. It says, for all digital pur- purchases, Apple charges a 30% commission and only recently instituted some exceptions. And those exceptions primarily are the 15% for your first million dollars that the judge will find is essentially because Apple is threatening to be sued all the time. Apple's establishment of a 30% commission rate has remained static since the onset. Over time and given Apple's success, some developers have actively complained about the 30% commission. The court recognizes that the developers have sued Apple on behalf of a class, arguing that the rate is too high. Unlike those developers, Epic Games challenges the levy of any commission and did not offer a survey showing developers agreed with this position, only the anecdotal evidence of a couple. However, it is also true that with few exceptions, not every business is entitled to have access to what is effectively shelf space if they cannot afford to pay a commission to the platform host. While Apple's 30% commission began as a corollary to the 30% rate being charged in the gaming industry, the evidence is substantial that the economic factors driving that rate do not apply equally to Apple. Other gaming industry participants operate under a distinctly different economic model, facing different levels of competitive pressure. For example, unlike those in the computer gaming market, nothing other than legal action seems to motivate Apple to reconsider pricing and reduce rates. So I talked about subtweeting, right? Subtext that the judge is putting out there. You heard some about Project Liberty and Epic. This is one of those where the judge just fires a volley right across the bow at Apple. Apple is not motivated to do anything outside of legal action. That's quite the statement, right? And that doesn't mean anything for the ultimate uh, determination in this case, but it does tell you a little bit about where the judge's head is at. She doesn't really care for either of these parties. Missing from the record is any normative measure of what standard guidelines in respect of app review should be. Perfection is not practical, nor the business norm. If you go back and you listen to the Just the Trial playlist, you'll see a number of days 
where part of Epic's argument was effectively that Apple doesn't catch everybody, that their security features don't get everything, don't prevent bad things from happening. In fact, Epic doing what they did with the hotfix was suggestive of Apple not being able to catch everything in the process. One of the things we said as part of those videos, however, is that it wasn't a terribly strong argument from Epic because the law doesn't require perfection. The law requires you to take reasonable steps and in a context of an antitrust action, it requires you to be able to justify why you're doing what you're doing, even if it might otherwise be anti-competitive or restrain trade in some way. So harping on Apple's mistakes didn't make a ton of sense unless you were intending to argue that their claim that what they were doing was for security purposes was entirely pretextual. We'll see the word pretextual throughout this document in a couple of places. In legal speak, it means lying, that what you're telling the court is the reason that you did something is just pretext for a different reason that you're doing it on Epic's theory that Apple just wants more money. It wants to be anti-competitive. And so it's doing these things not for security reasons, but for some other reason. But as we'll see here, the court basically thinks that Apple's right, that there are security features that come from an in-person review. And so it was never going to be a very strong argument on Epic's behalf. Tangentially related is the app guidelines approach to cloud-based game streaming, which is discussed below with respect to market definition. Now, one of the reasons I highlighted this, even though I didn't highlight the subject of the paragraph itself, is that this was one of those areas where I thought NVIDIA and Microsoft had a much, much stronger case that Apple was acting arbitrarily, capriciously to benefit its own applications at the expense of these other developer competitor applications. And that if either of those parties wanted to, they would have been able to bring a stronger case. And you see hints of that in this document. Again, I can't summarize all 185 pages in any kind of reasonable timeline here, but it's worth highlighting that the court does talk about streaming in a couple of places, suggesting that those might have been even better plaintiffs. Epic Games raises legitimate concerns regarding some of the consequences of Apple's app guidelines and its refusal to share control of data absent customer agreement. First, these are findings of the court, Apple does a poor job of mediating disputes between a developer and its customer. With respect to refunds, the DPLA gives Apple sole discretion to refund a full or partial amount of user purchases. Thus, developers lack the ability to provide refunds and have worse customer service as a result. Moreover, because Apple lacks visibility into the transaction, it has created overly simplistic rules to issue refunds, which can also increase fraud. Court is out here saying Epic has legitimate concerns. Apple does a poor job of mediating, takes control away from developers in respect of refunds, makes rules that allows them to be defrauded more than they might otherwise be defrauded. And yet, Epic's not going to ultimately win on this argument. Second, Epic Games argues that the lack of direct connection to consumers impacts the developer's ability to obtain key analytics, such as real-time reporting about its customers' spending behavior. While the court finds Epic Games may profit from having real-time reporting about an individual spending behavior, ample evidence shows that Epic Games already reaps immense profits from impulse purchasing. Little societal value exists in allowing plaintiff to capitalize on more customer data to exploit customer habits. And if you sit back and say, that doesn't sound like it's particularly useful to this case. It sounds a little bit like the judge's editorializing. I would agree with you. You get a lot of this in this document. You write 180 pages on any subject. You're probably going to see some editorializing. I would be guilty of it as well. But you see this kind of upsetness, not just with the way Apple does business, but with video games and Epic. Little societal value exists in allowing plaintiff to capitalize on more customer data. Not really the question before the court. And it comes across as just a little bit antagonistic towards these parties and their claim on the whole. Notwithstanding Mr. Barnes's choice to compare the App Store's operating margins to those of other online stores, under any normative measure, the record supports a finding that Apple's operating margins tied to the App Store are extraordinarily high. Games have played an integral part of the App Store since at least 2016. In 2016, for instance, despite game apps only accounting for approximately 33% of all app downloads, game apps nonetheless accounted for 81% of all App Store billings that year. Gaming is incredibly important to Apple, and it's distinguishable from the overall app marketplace. It's one of the reasons you'll see the court make that delineation. Rather than applying it to all apps, they will apply to specifically gaming apps because Apple makes so much money because there are structural issues. Apple 
puts games and productive apps in different places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Review of the party's proposed product market and finding. The court reviews the factual basis for each of the three pro-offered product markets. Epic Games offers two aftermarkets, namely one, an aftermarket for the distribution of iOS apps, the games themselves, and two, an aftermarket for payment processing for iOS apps. The four market for each hinges on the existence of a market for operating system for smartphones. So we'll take a step back. If you didn't follow some of that, Epic's claim here is basically that there is an aftermarket after you purchase a phone, after you purchase the operating system for that phone, then that aftermarket exists in the apps themselves. And then really as an after aftermarket, the payment processing associated with what you might buy within those apps. The for market for that is the operating system for the phone because Epic had a problem because Apple doesn't control the market for the phone itself. Apple and Android and Google and Samsung and everything else. There's a bunch of phones out in the market. But what Epic could claim is that Apple had a monopoly on distribution of the iOS operating system, which it absolutely does. And so they tried to use that as the for market. It would prove their undoing in this particular argument, but we'll see why in just a second. Apple proposes a market for digital games transactions. The court outlines the evidence for each in turn. Before reviewing each of the proposed markets, the court considers whether Apple's operating system should be viewed as a for market. The court finds that it should not. Now, If you're writing a short version of this opinion, you could explain why you found that it wasn't a four market and then you could skip all of this because without a relevant four market, there isn't an aftermarket kind of concept. And in fact, the court winds up saying that, but also says, well, we want to talk about it a little bit. Quite simply, it is illogical to argue that there is a market for something that is not licensed or sold to anyone. Competition exists for smartphones, which are more than just the operating system. And here's another area where we can take a step back, because one of the things I said earlier in the series was that Epic's case against Google is perhaps ironically, or at least unintuitively, stronger than its case against Apple. And one of the reasons for that is because Google markets its software to other hardware parties. Apple only ever makes iOS and its software to sell its own hardware. So it kills a lot of this argumenting because it's only ever using its own software. It's not trying to sell it to someone else. In the Google standpoint, you're trying to sell it to a third party and the court might well come down and say, well, now there's a market for that that can serve as a for market to these other aftermarkets that Epic might claim. Given the court's rejection of the for market theory, the aftermarket theory fails as it is tethered to the for market. Although the court rejects plaintiff's for market construct, it nonetheless discusses additional factual, factual problems with the aftermarket theory given plaintiff's focus on those issues. So, You might consider this if you're a lawyer or you're a law student looking at this as dicta. This isn't necessary for the court to arrive at its determination. Once it decides that the for market is wrong, everything else falls apart. But here at a trial court level, the judge is trying to give enough background to the circuit court that might disagree with what the trial court has decided here. And because Epic has focused so much on this argument, is very likely to appeal on this basis to provide the court's thinking as to why it wouldn't apply even if there was an iOS for market. So the judge here goes uh, on and on and on. We don't need to really dive into it that much, but we can read a few things here uh, that are pretty interesting. On balance, the court reads the emails to suggest that Apple sought to compete by distinguishing their product and in the process, making its platforms stickier. We saw the phrase stickier a lot in the trial and Epic applying that, oh, that was them trying to lock in people illegally. And I said, well, every company tries to keep its customers. Uh, You can go, you can read any business book anywhere and say, hey, it costs a lot less to retain your customers than it is to go and get a new one. So you try to make it sticky. And that might mean making it super attractive or it might mean something else, which is nefarious. But the court says this, however, making something stickier on its own is not necessarily nefarious. The evidence that Epic provided is not persuasive of switching costs on its own. The judge then goes and looks at the expert testimony. He says, there's simply no independent data to show that switching costs create meaningful lock-in in in this market. Moreover, the market is responding. Both Google and Apple are creating easier paths to convert customers from the other and deal with the switching costs. The court, as I said, especially in the United States, is going to be reluctant to impose its will on the marketplace, especially if... They think the market is in flux or very difficult to kind of corral. Here, the court finds that Google and Apple are dealing with switching costs. They're trying to attract each other's customers. Other things are happening. And so the court doesn't really want to get 
involved. From a broad perspective, Epic Games did not conduct any analysis of whether consumers know that they are buying into a walled garden. Plaintiff's argument is not grounded in legal principles. The two noted informal statements of Apple do not create a policy, especially in light of a written contract, much less one that shows the 30% is a change. However, the court does agree that the comments confirm that the 30% is not tied to anything in particular and can be changed. So here, Epic tried to establish that Steve Jobs in 2008 said the 30% is designed to pay for running the app store and we're giving all the money to the developers, quote unquote, et cetera, et cetera. And the court finds, well, those are internal statements not designed to do much of anything. And the 30% wasn't a promise. It wasn't a change because the store got more profitable that it would require to go down, those kinds of things. But also importantly, the court lays a couple of landmines for the future potentially against Apple in this document, says, that said, 30% is arbitrary. It, Apple failed to tie it to anything specifically. We didn't get documents that say this is the operating cost of the App Store. This is the amount of research and development we put in. This is why 30% makes sense. This is a number. And the court says when you just got a number, it can be changed. The court's not going to do that in this document, but it's going to provide a roadmap for someone else that might seek to have it changed. Thus, Apple's evidence strongly suggests that low switching between operating systems stems from overall satisfaction with existing devices rather than any lock-in. Epic failed in both switching costs and lock-in, all of this stuff. Apple was able to convince the court that essentially people like iPhones and that's why there's stickiness, if at all. In respect to substitutes, for Epic, there's an aftermarket for iOS app distribution for which there is no substitute as it occupies the entire field. Given Apple's proposed market of all digital game transactions, Apple argues that all the other game transaction platforms are substitute platforms for the App Store. So we're talking about substitution here. This is the aftermarket theory. Here we've got Epic saying, well, there's no substitute. We can't properly analyze it because Apple takes up everything. It's 100% monopolist of iOS app distribution. Apple says, well, the substitutes are numerous. We've got everything that competes with the App Store. Platforms include one's access through all devices, mobile, tablets, consoles, PCs. <laughs> Epic says no. And the court analyzes it and finds, as the court is wont to do, somewhere in the middle. Court finds Dr. Evans in, underestimates overall substitution. In conclusion, the Fortnite data is basically mixed. For all of these reasons, the Fortnite data does not reliably show lack of user substitution. The testimony, the experts, that battle for the experts we talked about in the series, didn't amount to a hill of beans because the court can't actually determine anything from what was said to it. Then we get to one of the more unfortunate actors in this long form stage play, and that is Dr. Rossi. If you recall from the series, and you can go check it out, of course, if you're so inclined, one of the areas where I had significant problems was with respect to the survey information that the experts were putting forth in the trial. And Dr. Rossi really takes it on the nose from the court. Dr. Rossi's survey suffers from several methodological flaws, including the language and timing of the survey. The questions did not convey that the price changes were intended to be both in future and permanent or non-transient in the vernacular of antitrust and merger law. Given the magnitude of the issues before the court, Dr. Rossi's choices did not ultimately assist in determining how a key demographic would make substitution decisions in the relevant market. Dr. Rossi's trial testimony revealed that he was more interested in a result which would assist his client's case than in providing any objective ground to assist the court in its decision making. Given Dr. Rossi's lack of credibility, the court strains to adopt his findings. So you've got an expert here that was just absolutely obliterated by the court and is probably not going to get hired for the same kind of analysis in the future. But, you know, who knows? Given the flaws in both the underlying survey from Dr. Rossi and Dr. Evans' calculations thereon, the court finds that this evidence is wholly unpersuasive of substitution. Here's another section, Epic and Apple, where you just wasted all of our time. Thank you very much. You can kind of hear the court's consternation. In evaluating Apple's market definition, remember they wanted to be all gaming transactions, Dr. Evans excludes tablets on the sole ground that they lack certain hardware features like a cellular connection. This is not persuasive. However, there are two issues with Apple's data. First, it inappropriately uses statistics about gamers as a whole to draw conclusions about iOS gamers. Apple has not shown that gamers as a whole are representative of iOS gamers. It may well be that 55 to 60% of US gamers play on more than one device, but the iOS gamers switch considerably less often. As the court says, we just don't know. 
Apple's evidence shows that large portions of the population, including young children, older adults, and most teenage girls play predominantly on mobile. So you can't just use gaming surveys to talk about what's happening on your phones. Recognizing the issue, Apple offers evidence by Dr. Hansen, who conducted two surveys. But while Dr. Hansen is considerably more credible and independent than Dr. Rossi, the court just keeps swinging at Dr. Rossi, Dr. Hansen's survey is also severely flawed and ultimately unreliable. This court just did not like any of the surveys. And having listened to the trial, I don't know that I can blame her at all. Third, on Dr. Hitt's side of things, he analyzes Fortnite data following its removal from iOS as described above for Dr. Evans. The evidence is mixed. Accordingly, Dr. Hitt and Dr. Craig's analysis shows evidence of both substitution and complementary playing without a definitive answer either way. Ultimately, the court proceeds without resolving the issue on this record. We don't find anything in respect to substitution. Okay. Now let's talk about gaming versus non-gaming. As explained above, Epic Games argues that its aftermarket should be defined to include all apps, not just gaming apps, as the distribution on the App Store is not limited. The evidence, the court says, demonstrates that the App Store in its current form generates virtually all its revenue upon a business model now rooted in the gaming market, both on game developers and gaming consumers. This is proved by both financial considerations and other notable distinctions between gaming and non-gaming apps. The court notes eight other significant differences which exist between game apps and non-game apps as the court considers the relevant product market. First, game apps revenue constitute between 60 and 75% of all app transactions. Second, there's an industry and public recognition of a distinct market for digital game app transactions as opposed to non-gaming apps. Games different than productivity. Both Apple's App Store and internal business structure support and reflect this division. On the App Store, editors consider a different set of factors when curating games for spotlight marketing than they do when curating other non-gaming apps. Seems good to me. Third, game app transactions are a distinct product because they exhibit peculiar characteristics and uses. Fourth, game developers often use specialized technology to create their game apps, and I'm not sure that's so good. Games use specialized technology, but so do productivity pieces of software. I, you know, it's clear that the court has decided that gaming is going to be the relevant market here. I don't think there's anything wrong with that but I'm not sure you need lists of nine things, either for Fortnite expenses or eight things here to distinguish. It's fine though. Fifth, game apps have distinct consumers and producers. I beg to differ. I have a lot of productivity apps and games on my phone, but that's fine. Sixth, game app transactions differ in pricing structure, including in monetization models and effective prices from non-gaming app transactions. And that's very, very true and probably should be higher than sixth which is that games themselves are very often free to play with the battle pass and the in-app purchases and productivity software might be on subscriptions through something else or at bare minimum using different metrics and ways of paying for access to that application than very many games do. And that is an important point to distinguish the two markets. Seventh, game apps are distributed by specialized vendors. Fair enough. Eighth and finally, platforms providing game app transactions are subject to unique and emerging competitive pressures. They talk a little bit more about cloud gaming, about Microsoft and NVIDIA and all that good stuff. Accordingly, in light of the foregoing, the court finds that there is a substantial distinction between the transactions for gaming apps and the transactions for non-gaming apps. And who am I to argue with her? I think she makes a good case there. Epic Games, facts relevant to iOS in-app payment processing aftermarket. Epic Games' assertion that the iOS in-app payment processing aftermarket is a relevant antitrust market relies on the assumption that Apple maintains a lawful monopoly in the iOS app distribution market. Because Epic Games cannot show such a market even exists, the argument fails at the outset. Plaintiff's proposal begs the question of whether IAP, again, that's the processing, not the purchases, is a product. Apple's IAP or in-app purchasing system is a collection of software programs working together to perform several functions at once in the specific context of a transaction on a digital device. IAP is not integrated into the app store itself, even though it is integrated into an iOS device. And by integrated, the court only means that the application has been engineered specifically to work seamlessly on the device. More specifically, Apple's IAP as used here is a secured system which tracks and verifies digital purchases, then determines and collects the appropriate commission on those transactions. IAP simultaneously provides information to consumers so that they can view their purchase history, share subscriptions with family members and across devices, manage spending by implementing parental controls, and challenge and restore purchases. This paragraph right here is, is going to be what Apple uses in its press releases and everything else, as well as its combating of South Korean law and other laws that might be popping up 
in the near future, that IAP is more than payment processing and it does this list of things. You don't have to agree with the court here, but once you acknowledge that the court has made this determination, you can see how the court arrives at giving Apple the predominance of the wins in the claims against it. Epic Games ignores this other functionality to argue that Apple merely matches developers to consumers, a matching service. This statement is partially true, but Apple has never argued that it levies a commission merely because it matches the developers with the customers. So the court's really not buying any of this argument from Epic that we're just talking about a Stripe or a PayPal when we're talking about IAP. Under current e-commerce models, even plaintiff's expert conceded that similar functionalities for other digital companies were not separate products. Under all models, Apple would be entitled to a commission or licensing fee even if IAP was optional. Payment processors have the ability to provide only one piece of the functionality. There is no evidence that they can provide the balance. Thus, the court finds Epic Games has not shown that IAP is a separate and distinct product. And here we have the first of our significant quotes that really should be appearing more often in the articles that you or I might be reading on this particular case. Apple doesn't lose the right to its licensing fee if it doesn't process your payments through IAP. That's fundamental to understanding how the relationship between Apple and its developers work. Apple, digital video game market. Apple proposes that the wider global digital video game market is the relevant product market. Epic Games opposes this product market. The court summarizes the evidence with respect to global digital video gaming. Given how the cases were litigated, much of the evidence relates to plaintiffs specifically. Defining a video game, and I highlighted this one just because I found it amusing. If you've been on Twitter or social media in general, if you've just been gaming for a while, you know that the discourse around what a video game is, what is art, can video games be art, what are messages, is one of those things that pops up from time to time. Here the court makes a fairly funny statement. The court begins with a definition of video game. Unfortunately, no one agrees, and neither side introduced evidence of any commonly accepted industry definition. Video games for the win. Who knows what it is? And the court dives in here and says, oh, it might be interactive, it might have a goal, etc., etc." Beyond this minimum, the video game market appears highly eclectic and diverse. Thank you very much. I think that's great. Video gaming is eclectic and diverse. And the court says, yeah, we don't know what a video game is. We got pages of this discussion. Ultimately, the court says it doesn't matter what a video game actually is because Fortnite's not at issue here, whether it's a metaverse or not. We could just talk about video games and the market as these particular stores divide them. And we talk a little bit more about the marketplace, the marketplace, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And then we get to a brief discussion on console gaming. If you follow this with us since the beginning, one of the things that popped out of this case at the start was that Epic's attack on Apple, and more specifically, that they were a monopolist provider of access to their walled garden, would seem applicable to the other console runners, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, because they run versions of a walled garden themselves, some more than others. Microsoft's trying to get away from that a little bit. But I had said right at the top of this series that if you accept Epic's theory of the case against Apple, you're gonna see lawsuits against Sony and Microsoft and everyone else because there's no reason to distinguish between those things if running your own operating system is a problem. So we see reference to consoles here. Based on the business models and choices undertaken by the players in the console gaming market, both Microsoft and Sony are in direct competition with each other, while the Nintendo Switch remains more distantly in the competitive orbit of these two devices. So here the judge says, yeah, Microsoft and Sony are the real players in console gaming, and then the Switch is in the competitive orbit of these two devices. Amusingly, the Switch has sold a, a million, million copies of itself, right? And the Switch is going to be one of the most successful consoles ever released, but it's not competing directly with how fast and how shiny can you make the graphics on your television. It's doing something different. Here the court, while trying to determine what is competing with an iPhone, is coming up with certain rules about it, and the Switch is not a part of that conversation, which is interesting because the Switch is mobile, but the court finds that the Switch is not competing specifically with the phone, and that makes the iPhone and Apple portion of the gaming mobile market bigger than it might otherwise would be. Despite these differences, there are similarities amongst the players in the console gaming market. Like iOS devices, the Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox have also adopted 
closed platforms, or walled gardens, as Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft do not allow users to install software on their consoles outside of the platform's official store. Moreover, unlike mobile gaming devices, console gaming platforms use similar controllers consisting of analog sticks, D-pads, and buttons located on the face and edges of the controller. The standard commission rate across these console platforms is, like both the App Store and Google Play App Store, 30%. Although Epic Games witnesses and other third-party witnesses testified that console makers regularly engage in negotiations with developers and secure terms that factor into the overall value that the app developer receives. Then we get a description of cloud-based gaming. We get a little bit more of that, which isn't really that pertinent to this case in question. But the court notes that with respect to the iOS platform, both NVIDIA and Microsoft maintain web apps instead of native apps. This happened actually, I think, between the trial and now. This is due to Apple's guidelines and rules prohibiting stores within applications and requiring the submission of each individual game to the App Store. Both companies would prefer to provide their services as native apps instead of web apps due to the ease of both optimizing the experience for game streaming users on devices and reducing latency. Neither company, however, provided evidence or testimony on the relative differences in latency between web apps and native apps, even as to the iOS platform Safari web browser. The court cannot otherwise discern, based on the limited record, whether being limited to web apps has otherwise affected these services, especially considering the foregoing evidence showing positive reception among consumers and the industry to both services on the iOS platform. Microsoft and NVIDIA did too good a job making their web browser applications, and now the court can't determine whether they were unduly harmed by being kicked off of the native app store. And that's a bit of irony here, but the reason the court's bringing it up would appear to again suggest that the judge here thinks that Microsoft or NVIDIA might have a little bit better ability to come at Apple for the way that it is imposing its rules on them, but it can't do so because nobody presented any evidence as to how it was being harmed by using these web browser applications. Stay tuned for that. If NVIDIA or Microsoft decides that they want to come after Apple, that's the likely avenue that they might choose to do it in. In a general sense, the court continues, consumers have a choice of device and transaction platforms through which to acquire, modify, and play games. Apple's mode of competing resorts to a historic model, user-friendly, reliable, safe, private, and secure. Of course, the court must determine where the actual competition lies between these platforms based on the current state of play in the overall market. This is a close question where the general video game market appears to be evolving and dynamic. Now, whenever you hear those words, when you're looking at an antitrust case, you can assume that the court's going to take a conservative approach. I don't mean Republican or anything like that. I mean that it's going to be reluctant to impose its will on a marketplace. And that's because courts don't like to look at an evolving and dynamic marketplace and stick their thumb in it. And so video games, and I think the court is right in this, are constantly changing with their percentages and who's winning and PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5 and Microsoft and everybody else. You've got entrants, even though we haven't had a new platform entrant in a while uh, in the console space, happening all the time to go take those market shares as Microsoft did a couple of decades ago. So the court's not enthused about jumping into the fray here. While there is some competition amongst the players in the general video game market, the court cannot say that this overall competition is sufficient for purposes of defining a relevant product market, at least not at this time. What makes this determination difficult is that the market appears to be somewhat in flux. With the recent success of truly cross-platform games like Microsoft's Minecraft and Epic Games' own Fortnite, these disparate platforms, each with their own unique and competitive advantages, are truly competing for consumers who wish to consume these increasingly popular cross-platform games and any transactions made therein. Indeed, video games can and are able to be ported across multiple devices. However, not all games are like Minecraft or Fortnite. The market still reflects that video games are, for the most part, cabined to certain platforms that take advantage of certain features of that platform, such as graphics and processing or mobility. The record reflects that the industry players are only slowly and recently reacting to compete against the wider gaming platforms. In response to this exact scenario, where gamers play on one platform but spend on another, some other platform owners have enacted substantive policies regarding cross-wallet and cross-play restrictions. Sony, for instance, enacts a cross-play policy that compensates Sony where players spend on other platforms, but primarily game on Sony's PlayStation platform. Now, as part of this discussion, we're going to see a couple of places where the court suggests, well, maybe Apple could license its intellectual property in a way that's different than the way it currently does with the 30% on in-app payment processing, all these other things. Keep that in mind. Put a pin in things like what Sony does 
because Apple isn't going to be restricted as part of this injunction or this court case from changing the way its business model works. And Epic, to some extent, doesn't care about that. There are discussions in this case about the fact that big time developers with well-known properties that maybe don't need Apple's marketing as much, don't really care if Apple winds up having to change to a per download model or has to impose things like a cross-play policy where you have to pay more if there's a big difference between how much you're using something on an Apple platform and where you paid for it, that Epic can withstand that, that the other big developers can withstand that. Keep all those things in mind because one of the things that's happening here is that Epic is fighting for itself. It's putting out marketing stuff about small developers, but that some of this stuff might well wind up in an Apple that might seem nefarious to you or I saying, all right, if we have to charge, for instance, to reflect the value of our intellectual property, then everybody's got higher expenses. We're charging per download and we're going to do things that might lock in big developers, but that are ultimately going to harm smaller developers in a way that you or I might not like. Also, unlike certain consoles, Apple does not require price parity. That is, developers are free to price their in-app content on apps downloaded from the App Store higher than the same content sold through other platforms. That's the other kind of thing that could well change. If Apple has to allow somebody to market their stuff, you could say, well, that's fine, uh, but you're not allowed to charge more over here than you do over there. That might be something that would again get challenged in court, but it's not on its face a problem. And you see the court referencing the fact that certain consoles do that kind of thing already. While these policies and cross-platform games might evidence some convergence of competition amongst them at some point in the future, the relevant product market does not appear to be so wide as to include all platforms at this time. And here the court distinguishes the Switch. Despite the foregoing, neither the Switch nor game streaming services are appropriately part of the mobile gaming market, at least not at this time. Thus, the court concludes that the competition lies within the smaller recognized mobile gaming transaction submarket. However, this submarket does not include the Switch or game streaming services, which leads us to discussing Apple's market share. The court next calculates Apple's market share. The only evidence of market share in the proposed market concerning video gaming comes primarily from Apple's expert witness, Dr. Hit. And taking another sidestep here, one of the things that comes out in a number of places in this document is that Epic didn't actually prepare evidence for what the court ultimately found the market to be, which is mobile gaming transactions. So they went whole hog after the foremarket and aftermarket approach with the theory being that the foremarket in the iOS itself led to this aftermarket and they didn't need to show this other stuff. The court is clearly dissatisfied with that. And you see reference here to talking about Apple's market share coming from Apple's expert. It's a little bit unusual in this context. The court has the most evidence for the year 2017. Using Apple's internal documents, the court is able to calculate Apple's market share at 57.1% in the global mobile gaming industry. The court reaches that value by taking Apple's own internal records for 2017, which show Apple's internal calculation of 24% of the global video gaming market and dividing the number by the 42%, which reflects Apple's belief of the portion of the mobile gaming market relative to the whole global video gaming market. As you can already see, we're talking about telephone games on top of telephone games. This is Apple's own records with estimates of these various things. The court putting them together in a way that might work to arrive at a number in 57.1% that is both a lot of power if you're Apple, but also not enough power if you're Epic. Nonetheless, even assuming the market were limited to both mobile gaming and console gaming, Apple would still have, at minimum, market power. For the years in the record, the court's methodology based upon the record showed that Apple would have a market share of such a defined global video gaming market of 32.9%. It's about 30% if you include everything else. And they include that particular reference in case the circuit court or someone else decides to go in a different direction. Proposed geographic market. The parties offer differing perspectives on the geographic market. Epic Games argues for a global market, excluding China, and Apple asserts a domestic market. Ultimately, the court finds more persuasive that Apple actually treats app distribution as a global enterprise and finds the geographic market to be global. I think that's right. I think we all think of those kinds of things as generally globalized when we talk about digital app distribution. As an initial matter, as detailed above, the 30% commission was not set by competition or the costs of running the app store, but as a corollary to other gaming commission rates. Apple, on the other hand, cites the reduction on second year subscriptions in the small business program as evidence of price decreases. Hey, your honor, we're lowering prices all the time. The subscription reduction is highly probative, says the court. 
The evidence shows that Apple's decision coincided with several large developers ending in in-app subscriptions through iOS apps and therefore exercising power to leave Apple's platform. However, as described above, subscription apps face different market conditions than games, and there is no evidence of game developers leaving for other platforms to force a price decrease. Further, the court has explained above why the evidence on Apple's motivations regarding the small business program is mixed, and that's in the paragraphs that we talked about, where the court essentially says Apple only moves when legal action is threatened, and I can't really disagree with her on that particular supposition. And... We're finishing off the fact findings here. We're 94 pages into the document. We're just about ready to go into part two, but we got a few more things to hit before we do. These contractual terms in the DPLA are standardized and non-negotiable. A contract of adhesion, if you've heard that reference before, it's, it's like the EULA that you see. You can't negotiate it, you accept it, or you don't. You adhere to it, or you don't. Only a few developers have succeeded in modifying these terms by threatening to go to other platforms, specifically Spotify and Netflix, have removed in-app purchasing functionality from iOS apps. On the other hand, both DownDog and Match Group have testified in this case that they have been unable to entice users to other platforms with lower prices. Match Group has employed marketing campaigns and promotions for web purchases, but the app sales have continued to dominate. DownDog has had better success at offering cheaper subscriptions on the web, but Apple's anti-steering provision has prevented it from directing users to the cheaper prices. More on that later, as we already know. Accordingly, evidence shows Apple's anti-steering restrictions artificially increase Apple's market power by preventing developers from communicating about lower prices on other platforms. In respect of Apple's operating margins, which we already talked about, the court says are huge, the court finds that operating margins are probative of market power. Apple is responsible for its own lack of transparency in determining what its operating margins are, so they're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. If you were here with us during the trial, you heard a lot about, oh, we don't keep those operating margins separately. And yeah, we made a lot of money, but it all goes into R&D on the platform. And so we don't really know what that number is specifically. The judge says, well, that's fine, but we're going to hold it against you. And so I'm going to do my own math to determine that it's a heck of a lot of money. In light of these uncertainties, the court finds that barriers to entry are currently relatively high, but are plausibly decreasing and may lower in the future. Epic Games contends that Apple's restrictions on iOS app distribution and in-app payment processing create anti-competitive effects. With respect to Apple's app distribution restrictions, actually moving products, the apps themselves, Epic Games focuses on the following anti-competitive effects, foreclosing competition, increasing consumer app prices, decreasing the output, decreasing innovation, and effect on other markets through the restrictions on app stores. Apple, in turn, argues that the restrictions provide a safe and secure place to conduct game transactions and compensate Apple for its pro-competitive investments in iOS. In respect of foreclosure of competition, with respect to that issue, the contention is not in dispute. Quite simply, Epic Games wanted to open a, comp a competing app store and could not. So Apple's rules foreclose competition. Now understand, that's not the end of the story. We're gonna be talking about the rule of reason, which we've talked about as part of this series, but you're allowed to do things uh, that are anti-competitive. The law doesn't support competition or competitors. It supports consumers. And the way that consumers get the most value out of the economy is through that competition. But you're allowed to be essentially very, very competitive by keeping other competitors out of the way. And yet, when we talk about this from the court's perspective, they're going to look at this and say, yeah, you foreclosed that competition. Do you have a good enough reason to have done that? And the court's going to side with Apple on a lot of this. While plaintiff did not survey developers taken together, this evidence suggests that Apple's restrictions foreclose competition for large game developers who have well-known games. These developers would likely, and have the resources to, open their own stores to forego Apple's fees, rules, and review. Smaller developers, on the other hand, would likely stay on the App Store, or comparable store, for product discovery reasons. Indeed, that is exactly what happened earlier on PCs, which bolsters the likely evaluation and outcome. Next, Epic Games argues that Apple's app distribution restraints increase prices for consumers. The court finds Epic Games' argument to be plausible. Apple vigorously disputes the evidence. First, it points out that the 30% commission is standard for other stores, including on competitive platforms. However, Apple's argument is suspect, finds the court. One, Apple relies on headline rates that Dr. Evans and Dr. Shamalansi agree are frequently negotiated down. For example, the Amazon App Store has a headline rate of 30%, but its effective commission is only 18.1. Both Ms. Wright and Mr. Sweeney testify that consoles frequently negotiate special deals for large developers, and sealed evidence in this case confirms the same. Two, just because it is the competitive rate for games in the console market does not mean that the rate translates to the mobile games market. 
As described above, the App Store has very different operating margins than consoles, so even if the commission is the same, the economics and the nature of the products are very different. Thus, ultimately, these comparisons are not useful because the other stores do not operate in the same market. So here the court is answering one of those questions a lot of people pose during the trial and elsewhere in this series, and that is by discounting the console players in the market entirely, she is saying that their 30% that Microsoft charges, that Nintendo charges, that Sony charges, isn't terribly informative to the 30% that Apple charges in what she views as a completely different market. This is the kind of logic, the kind of thing that might well come up on appeal on the Apple side of things when they want to talk a little bit more about what the relevant market is and what you should take into account because that 30% is the second step of a fight like this one. The court doesn't back the 30%. The court doesn't say much of anything about the 30% except that it's not justified in the evidentiary record. And so Apple's going to look at a court case like this and say one of the places that we have to shore up our defenses is to establish why 30% exists, why it's okay, and might well get into the fray on topics like this one. Last, Apple argues that the 30% rate is commensurate with the value developers get from the App Store. This claim is unjustified, says the court. One, as noted in the prior section, developers could decide to stay on the App Store to benefit from the service that Apple provides, but absent competition, it is impossible to say that Apple's 30% commission reflects the fair market value of its services. Now here the court is kind of doubling back on itself a little bit, right? Apple has something like 50x% percent control of the gaming transaction market as determined by the court, but that's a lot of places where somebody that wants to sell games can go elsewhere. Instead, the court says that 30% doesn't mean anything because there isn't competition. So it's a little bit like taking Epic's argument on its faith and saying, yeah, that's right. There isn't competition in the app distribution or in-app payment processing markets. And that 30% is just coming out of nowhere. But it doesn't make a lot of sense with the rest of the things that the court has said here. It's very interesting. And you can see that the court kind of twists itself in knots in a couple of places to deliberately say that 30% is not something that's justified by Apple. The court will not make a factual finding that 30% makes any sense. And so has provided Epic with a certain amount of ammunition, Epic and everybody else that wants to follow in their footsteps, to challenge the 30%. It's also worth noting that this judge has been a part of lawsuits against Apple for a long, long time. We just covered in virtual legality, the Cameron settlement, that was about 30% being too high. The judge is a human being. She can't prevent herself from knowing all the things that have been said about the 30%. And so in this particular court decision, you're seeing a lot of, I think 30% is too high, the judge says. This isn't going to put this on paper. This isn't going to make a factual finding about it, but is hinting at it around every paragraph of this particular decision. Continuing. Accordingly, the court finds that Apple's restrictions on iOS game distribution have increased prices for developers. In light of Apple's high profit margins on the App Store, a third-party store could likely provide game distribution at a lower commission and thereby either drive down prices or increase developer profits. The court must reserve on whether Apple's restrictions have increased prices for consumers as the evidence is mixed. Here, Epic Games' role as a consumer is not in the traditional sense, but only in the sense of a consumer of transactions with traditional consumers. This issue was not the focus of the trial. And that's an important aspect of all this. Epic is a consumer of Apple's transaction services, but at the end of the day, the Sherman Antitrust Act and antitrust law in the United States in general is most focused with what we usually think of as end users, consumers, the actual people playing the video game on their phone, not the people that are involved in IAP processing transactions with Apple. And here the court makes an important determination, says we don't have any idea whether higher prices to developers actually trickle down to consumers. And there's reason to believe that they don't in the way that Epic Games has their 12% and still sells games at the same price, that they didn't change the pricing for V-Bucks when they were selling it directly for their console until they did this big drop so that they could show a discount against Apple. There's a whole host of reasons to suggest that it doesn't necessarily trickle down to the consumer on the whole. And if it doesn't, then the law isn't that interested in protecting developers in this particular context. Decreased output, the parties dispute impact on output. Apple argues that the amount of iOS game output has increased over time. On this, the court agrees. Unfortunately, what is needed is a comparison of output in a but-for world without the challenge restrictions. Such comparison is not on the record. I'm not exactly sure what the court would want on the record for the multiverse version of how many apps would have been created but for these restrictions, but maybe 
she would have been satisfied with an expert on the record in some scientific capacity asserting what that might be. But this is one of the inherent problems when we talk about questions of this nature. We have no idea what the world looks like with a completely different set of rules underneath it. Thus, the analysis is insufficient to determine that Apple's restrictions had either a negative or a positive impact on game transaction volume. Next, Epic Games argues that Apple's app distribution restrictions harm innovation. Epic Games makes two arguments. First, it argues that Apple's 30% commission imposes a burden on developers who either reduce their game investment or forego making games altogether. Second, Epic Games argues that Apple's restrictions have reduced innovation in game distribution itself. Now, notably, Apple conducted developer surveys in 2010 and 2017. The c- comparing the two indicates that Apple, again, finding of the court here, is not moving quickly to address developer concerns or dedicating sufficient resources to their issues. Innovators do not rest on laurels. Put those together and the court is saying that they don't believe that Apple is an innovator. And if they aren't an innovator on this particular question, then that's suggestive of the fact that Apple might well be in the wrong and Epic might be right with their claim that Apple's rules here are preventing or at least slowing down innovation. The court continues, Apple's slow innovation stems in part from low investment in the App Store. Ultimately, the point is not that the Apple provides bad services. It does not. Most developers are satisfied with the App Store, particularly with its developer tools. Rather, the point, the court says, is that a third-party App Store could put pressure on Apple to innovate by providing features that Apple has neglected. Because this competition is currently precluded, Apple's restrictions reduce innovation in core game distribution services. Epic then raises two other potential anti-competitive effects. First, Epic Games argues that Apple self-preferences its own apps. This is something that we saw in the report made by Congress about big tech and Apple in particular. The court says, nah, not so fast. Upon review, the pro offer is weak. Mr. Shoemaker clearly believes that Apple misuses its app review process. Aside from his limited deposition excerpts, however, there is little objective evidence of self-preferencing. For instance, Apple Arcade apparently complies with App Store requirements that each game be individually downloaded. There is thus at least a factual dispute about whether it accords with the guidelines. As to Google Voice and Rhapsody, even Mr. Shoemaker acknowledges that they were the first of their kind and that Apple just didn't know how to respond during app review. Second, Epic Games argues Apple's restrictions reduce middleware that could decrease switching costs and increase competition. But as noted above, Dr. Athey's analysis is plausible, but as the court finds, wholly lacking in supporting evidence. Now that's the list of things that are potentially anti-competitive. Right? And that sounded pretty bad if you're on Apple's side of this question. It sounded like the court found a number of ways that the rules that Apple has put forth could be held to be anti-competitive. But it's important to know that that's not that unusual. And as we talked about when discussing the Sherman Antitrust Act at the top of this series, it prohibits restraints on trade. It prohibits these bad things. But it also notes, or at least the judiciary has noted, that virtually anything that you can do with your business, with a contract or otherwise, is a restraint on trade in some capacity. Anything that you do to advantage yourself is anti-competitive in the fact that it seeks to harm competitors. Competitiveness in and of itself is trying to kill competitors, is trying to beat them in the marketplace or otherwise. And the law only really cares if you start doing that unreasonably, unduly, in a way that is unfair. And so the rule of reason comes in and says, okay, if Epic can show that there are these anti-competitive effects, the court just found that they did, Apple gets a crack at saying, here are the reasons we do those things that are pro-competitive. Yes, they might have these anti-competitive effects, but we're allowed to do these things for these pro-competitive reasons. That's the next section of this decision. Business justifications. Apple asserts two business justifications for its app distribution restrictions. First, it argues that prohibitions on third-party app stores help ensure a safe and secure ecosystem. We heard this a lot. A lot of you in my comments I know disagree with this. Apple's not that safe. It's all BS. Fine. The court finds it to be legitimate. Second, Apple claims that the distribution restrictions are part of its intellectual property licensing arrangement for which it is entitled to be paid. Those of you keeping track at home can probably already tell we're about to get some of those quotes that I mentioned at the top of this video. In respect of security, Apple takes a broader view than Epic of security that includes user privacy, reliability, and trustworthiness. It isn't just running malware on their platform. Even there, however, the court finds that just in respect of running malware, Apple is still in the right and Epic is wrong. Under a narrow conception of security, the court finds Apple protects from malware on iOS in at least four ways. Malware scanning, registering with certificates, sandboxing, and reliability checks. 
For these types of attacks, social interaction attacks, human app review, the court finds, plays a meaningful role. The court agrees with Epic Games that this process is imperfect. However, the overall error rate appears to be relatively small, with Apple's former head of app review testifying that it was around 15% as of 2015. Removing app distribution restrictions could reduce this effectiveness, the court says. And this is the way you hear it phrased when the court's about to determine that Apple has provided a pro-competitive justification for why they do what they do. The court continues, decentralized distribution thus increases the risk of infection by giving malware more opportunities to break through. Second, with respect to sideloading, app review is likely impossible and thus could not prevent social engineering attacks. Thus, the court finds that centralized distribution through the app store increases security in the narrow sense, malware, primarily by thwarting social engineering attacks. With respect to a broader definition of security, there is less dispute that app distribution restrictions help ensure privacy, quality, trustworthiness, and the court goes through these various things. As with objectionable content, Epic Games responds by showing that scams still slip through app review, but for the same reasons, this anecdotal evidence does not show that scams and other fraud would not be higher without app review. You don't have to prove that you're perfect, you have to prove that you're doing something and that it's not pretextual. What's the impact of these things on the market? First, the court finds, App Review provides Apple with a competitive differentiator. When Apple first launched the App Store, it sought to strike a really good path between the dependability of a closed device and the ability to run third-party apps of a PC. Second, there is evidence that Apple's restrictions benefit users. As noted above, many users value their iOS devices for their privacy and security. As the result of having a trusted app environment, users make greater use of their devices, including by storing sensitive data and downloading new apps. The witnesses are unanimous that user security and privacy are valid pro-competitive justifications. Thus, the evidence shows that developers both benefit and suffer from app distribution restrictions. More people buying more things and using more apps undoubtedly helps developers. Rules that make it harder for developers to get their game into the marketplace and otherwise realize that benefit harms them. But the court finding that kind of pro and anti-competitive nature is likely to allow it if there's a pro-competitive justification actually offered. After you get past that point, after you get past Apple saying, here are the reasons we do it, security, right? Then Epic gets to say, well, there's a way that you could get that same benefit and be less anti-competitive. Epic Games argues that the security and privacy benefits described above can be achieved without app distribution restrictions. As explained, most of the benefits derive from app review, which screens for social engineering attacks, filters fraud and offensive content, and imposes heightened privacy requirements. Epic Games argues that the same benefits can be achieved in other ways. It focuses on two alternative models. First, under an enterprise program model, Apple could focus on certifying app stores instead of apps. The enterprise program is an existing model for distributing apps on iOS, where companies apply to distribute apps within its organization. Apple reviews the company, and if conditions are met, gives it a certificate that allows it to sign apps for distribution. It's a kind of favored nation status that it could give to an enterprise partner. Second, under a notarization model, Apple could continue to review apps without limiting distribution. The notarization model is currently used on Mac. There, Apple scans apps using automatic tools and notarizes them as safe before they can be distributed without a warning. The notarization model, as the court finds, is particularly compelling because Apple contemplated a similar model when developing iOS. Apple responds in several ways. First, it disputes that the enterprise program provides a comparable model because it is used primarily for employers who rarely want to hack their own employees. That's a fair response. The court says it's factually true, but also notes, correctly, I think, that it provides little insight as to why a modified model would not work. Okay, the enterprise model works because you don't want to attack the own people that you've certified, but you could come up with a different methodology, couldn't you, Apple? Fair enough. Second, it claims that Macs face a different threat model and have more malware than iOS. Here, the court puts Apple's feet to the fire. It says, while Mr. Federighi's Mac malware opinions may appear plausible, they appear to have emerged for the first time at trial, which suggests he is stretching the truth for the sake of the argument. Prior to this lawsuit, Apple has consistently represented Mac as a secure and safe from malware. Thus, the court affords Mr. Federighi's testimony on this topic little weight. In any case, even if notarization is less secure on Mac, that only shows the limits of malware scanning. Ultimately, the court finds persuasive that app review can be relatively independent of app distribution. Thus, even though unrestricted app distribution likely decreases security, alternative models are readily achievable 
to attain the same ends, even if not currently employed. So the court finds somewhere in the middle, right? Epic says there are alternatives. The court kind of likes this notarization alternative. These are just findings. In fact, we haven't gotten to the application of the law yet. You want to keep your eye on that because again, Apple's going to win this portion of the case and the court's ultimately not going to find that these alternatives are useful. On intellectual property, the court agrees with the general proposition that Apple is entitled to be paid for its intellectual property. Epic Games does not venture to argue that Apple is not entitled to be paid for its intellectual property, but rather claims that the investments Apple's made have nothing to do with the App Store specifically. Thus, the court finds that with respect to the 30% commission rate specifically, Apple's arguments are pretextual. Again, that's legal for lying, but not to the exclusion of some measure of compensation. And here's where the court is really slicing that onion thinly, right? Apple's going to win this case. I've already told you that. We already know that. But that 30% is out in the wind. It is over the cliff. The court has afforded no defenses to the 30%. It says, yeah, Apple's owed some portion of money. And that's what journalists and outlets that are talking about this are missing. But the court's unwilling to commit to a specific number, which unfortunately, when we're talking about legal decisions, isn't terribly useful. If you're Apple or you're Epic or maybe even anybody else that wants to run something like them, you'd like to have some level of understanding of what the court's even thinking. Here they just say, ah, oh, you didn't prove your 30%. The 30% is pretextual, which is a little strong for this. I think it's a bit more proper to call it arbitrary from what the court has described here. But that Apple is deserving of some level of compensation. Apple agrees that it is not a payment processor. Apple delegates actual payment processing to third parties, such as Visa, in case you didn't know. Epic continues to try to say you only are owed 2 to 3%. That's what Apple pays for someone else to process the payments through the App Store. Apple cites three additional pro-competitive business justifications for its payment processing restrictions. As with app distribution, Apple cites security, including privacy and fraud prevention, collection of its commission, and compensation for its intellectual property. As explained above, the court agrees that decentralization may decrease security in some instances. So the court's basically buying the security argument. One of Apple's strongest arguments for IAP security was that it can verify digital good transactions. The court is disappointed though. The evidence shows, however, that Apple itself does not perform the confirmation. Apple's head of pricing, Mr. Gray, testified that Apple simply asks the developer to confirm that delivery occurred and then issues a receipt. Apple has not shown how the process is any different than other payment processors and any potential for fraud prevention is not put into practice. So the court says, again, pretext. Apple says you could prevent fraud that way. The court says, nah, you're not actually checking anything in any useful capacity. Now, I'm not sure I agree with that fully. I think if you've aggregated all this information in a centralized payment processing system and you don't have to go to third parties to get that reporting or anything else, you probably have the ability to analyze things a little bit more. The court isn't actually looking at that, but is looking at the fact that Apple isn't doing separate confirmations for itself. And that's totally fair to call them out on. Commission collection. Next. Apple claims that IAP provides the most efficient method for collecting its commission. Dr. Shomalenzi opines that without IAP, the processing, Apple would have to rely on sellers to remit its 30% commission with little recourse other than a lawsuit if the money was withheld. Remember, this is exactly what we were talking about when we talked about the South Korean bill, right? Apple doesn't lose the right to make its commission because it didn't process your payment. The processing of the payment is useful to Apple, as it says here, as the court finds, because if you're in the business of collecting money, it's always better to be the party collecting the money. Because if you're getting a dollar and you have to divide it into 70 cents and 30 cents, it's better to get that dollar yourself, keep your 30 cents and give the 70 cents away, rather than depending on the other person to get that dollar, keep their 70 cents and give you your 30 cents. In all cases, with other things being equal, you'd rather be the guy that gets the money. And so Apple would like to be that guy. The court finds the fact of the commission is separate from the actual amount of the collection, and the court will address that next. A corollary point to the topic concerns Apple's restrictions on developers' ability to provide consumers with information about their transactions. Guideline section 3.1.1 states that apps may not include buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. This guideline does not prohibit steering towards purchasing mechanisms outside the App Store or its apps, such as on social media, as long as it does not target iOS users, but other provisions in those same review guidelines imply as much. 
So the court is once again bringing the area where it's going to give Epic the win into these various other sections and pointing out one thing that I think is important, I think Apple really screwed up on and has historically, which is that they say things to the public, or in this case, to the court, that don't really match up with the letters in their review guidelines, right? We talked about this when it happened. Apple went into court and said, oh, no, they could send emails to people and tell them about your sales. You just can't do it based on registration. You go, you read the sections before it was adjusted for the Cameron settlement, and you say, I don't read it that way, Apple. I think you're pretty restrictive there. And I was like, no, 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 we would never enforce it that way, which I don't blame anybody for being like, hey, I can't, I can't depend on the global multinational billion trillion dollar entity to not enforce the rules the way that they would appear to be on paper. I can't build my livelihood off of that. And I think the court calls them out on that and says, hey, Apple says you can do things on social media, can do things in email. It doesn't read that way. And so I'm going to point it out here, says the judge, because I'm going to hit him pretty hard on it when it ultimately comes down to that in terms of the law. Value of intellectual property. As described above, Apple has not adequately justified its 30% rate. There's that repetitive comment. Merely contending that its commission pays for the developer's use of the App Store platform licensed to Apple's intellectual property and access to Apple's user base only justifies a commission, not the rate itself. Now, this didn't appear in the quotes because it's not as pithy as some of the other things that are in this document. But understand that that sentence says what is important as part of this concept as well. Those kinds of things justify a commission. That's the court's finding and the court's right. It just doesn't establish what the rate should be. For these developers, Apple's role in generating in-app purchases was nothing. People that were otherwise searching for the apps, but it continued to receive a 30% commission on in-app purchases. Court clearly has a problem with the 30%. Epic didn't brief or argue about the 30% vis-a-vis the percentage itself. So the court finds itself making a decision without changing that percentage. Looking at the combination of the challenge restrictions and Apple's justifications and lack thereof, the court finds that common threads run through Apple's practices which unreasonably restrain competition and harm consumers, namely the lack of information and transparency about policies which affect consumers' ability to find cheaper prices, increased customer service, and options regarding their purchases. More specifically, by employing anti-steering provisions, consumers do not know what developers may be offering on their websites, including lower prices. While some consumers may want the benefits of Apple offers, Apple actively denies them the choice. These restrictions are also distinctly different from the brick and mortar situations. Apple created an innovative platform, but it did not disclose its rules to the average consumer. Apple has used this lack of knowledge to exploit its position. Thus, loosening the restrictions will increase competition as it will force Apple to compete on the benefits of its centralized model, or it will have to change its monetization model in a way that is actually tied to the value of its intellectual property. And I highlighted that last bit in red, and then we're going to go into part two, which I know you've long been waiting for. But I highlighted that part in red because this is an important piece of the epic puzzle. You might remember, it's been a long time, I know, that when we covered Apple's counter response and counter suit to epic, one of the things that Apple brought up was that, yeah, we could have done this business model in 16 different ways. We could have charged people per download. We could have $10,000 to join the App Store. We wanted to have more bodies. We wanted to have essentially a subsidy system where the people that were making the most money off the platform were allowing the platform to have this myriad of other apps that really didn't make any money. And that's how we built the thing. And we built it and it's been that way forever. And Epic wants to change that in a way that suits itself, that makes itself money, that makes itself wealth. And the court here backs that up a little bit. The court says, hey, we don't think that your 30% is necessarily justified by the fact that you're giving access to your intellectual property, that you're giving that digital shelf space, that ephemeral space within your app store because all these various different parties get different benefits from access to that store. Maybe they make money, maybe they don't. Maybe they make subscriptions on a website, maybe they don't. Maybe they sell V-Bucks or something else into your ecosystem. All of those parties have different interests. And so when you come to the court, and say, we're charging based on the value of access to our intellectual property. The court says, yeah, you're you're entitled to license that up. The copyright laws, trademark laws, very specific about the fact that you can have the right to control access to your iOS and to the IP and everything else. But your argument that it's tied specifically to that fails because of all these various reasons and all these different ways in which companies operate. And the thing that I fear the most out of all this, Epic's making a lot of noise, ringing a lot of bells, is an Apple that looks at this and says, okay, fine. 
we're going to change our business model into something that maybe Epic likes, but that is not terribly useful to a whole host of people. And that is maybe not going to have the same problems with laws and court decisions like this one, but doesn't actually afford consumers a, a better product. And, and that's what I get concerned with when you start talking about these kinds of things. We don't know what'll happen. This will be appealed. Apple will appeal it, but also Epic will appeal it. There's other laws, there's other lobbying efforts, there's other restrictions that are going to be considered in the immediate future, in the next five years, certainly, that Apple and Google are going to have to deal with. But as we sit here before all that happens, one of the things I would say and I would recommend to ask yourself is when we get to that point, when we see what these things become after all that, let's evaluate whether or not things have improved. Epic wants more money. Great. Great for them. I don't begrudge anybody trying to go get more money. Certain of these developers want that. Is the consumer experience improved? Is there actually more competition? Or is it a mishmash of things and these companies are forced to adopt a business model that doesn't improve anything for anybody except Tim Sweeney and the Epics of the world? It'll be worth following. And this is the kind of line that is suggestive to me that the court system, the judiciary, and maybe the Sherman Act and the antitrust laws of the United States itself are pretty poorly positioned to deal with modern questions of this type. It's a bit of an interlude before we pop into part two. Part two, as we discussed way back when, an hour and a half ago, is the application of those facts that the court has found to the actual law itself. So we've talked about legal frameworks. We're going to skip a lot of this because we've talked so often about it in virtual legality, but the court's establishing what these various theories are. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to try to establish the market. And we can skip a lot of this because the fact finding was well done and we know exactly how the court arrived at its decision. So first, the court finds that the relevant app store product is transactions, not services, which was pretty self-evident. It's putting parties together, a buyer and a seller. It's the transaction themselves that is what Epic is interacting with coming out of Apple. So it's transactions. The court then concludes based on its earlier findings of fact that the appropriate sub-market is digital game transactions. And then it continues to find that between digital game transactions and all app transactions, the relevant product is those game transactions. The appropriate submarket to consider is the mobile gaming transactions market. And even without Apple documents, the experts largely agree that mobile and non-mobile platforms provide different types of games. Thus, that relevant product market is mobile gaming transactions. Where there is no product or market for smartphone operating systems, as we already talked about, the court has found. There are no derivative markets. There are no aftermarkets. Nonetheless, the court addresses the additional problems with Epic Games' attempt to define the market within the confines of a single brand. And here we have a slightly different way that the court finds Epic to have failed on its aftermarket theory. It says that the Supreme Court identified two factors that supported the aftermarket framework. The existence of significant information costs and switching costs. Talks about a case called NuCal in 2008 in the Ninth Circuit, which outlined four factors that could indicate whether an alleged market is properly defined single brand aftermarket under that Eastman Kodak case, which we discussed as part of this series. And we're going to skip most of those factors. It says the fourth, however, is that competition in the initial market does not necessarily suffice to discipline anti-competitive practices in the aftermarket. There's competition between Samsung and Apple and Google in selling phones and getting out there. And that fourth factor says, if it's insufficient to properly compete in that market, you might have an aftermarket that causes a problem. But the court says it's with that last indicator that problems arise for Epic. Issues of lock-in or switching costs and notice of consumer knowledge fall under the analysis of evaluating whether competition in the initial market suffices. First, the evidence shows no material change in the conditions for accessing the App Store. In the Sixth Circuit, that's me, that's Michigan, the absence of a change in policy following the consumer's initial purchase in the alleged for market, which locked consumers into the alleged aftermarket, was fatal. If you didn't change something, it was fatal because you're deemed to know what it is you're buying. Epic's a sophisticated party, so this is even more applicable to them than someone else. For consumers, iOS has always been a closed system, and the App Store has been a walled garden with respect to native apps from its inception even prior to any time in which Apple was alleged to have become a monopolist. Second, Epic Games failed to prove lock-in, even absent a policy shift. In short, there is no evidence in the record demonstrating that consumers are unaware that the App Store is the sole means of digital distribution on the iOS platform. In fact, I'd argue that to some, that's the advantage that Apple has. They only want to interact with the App Store. They only want to buy games from a single store. And you don't have to agree with that at all. You could think they're the dumbest consumers on earth. It doesn't change the fact that some consumers are exhibiting that preference. 
In sum, with seasoned antitrust counsel at the helm, which again, we're subtweeting here for the judge, Epic Games created a market definition, which theoretically made a strong showing within the new Cal and Eastman Codec framework. But for the reasons explained above, the market definition was fundamentally flawed, and in any event, does not satisfy all four of the new Cal factors. And you can read into that paragraph what you will, but it sounds to me like the judge is saying, yeah, you had super expensive lawyers that can read the precedent, knows how to frame things and stub that square peg into that round hole, and still you failed. That this isn't what this is, which is why, if you go back to the very first episode in this series, I reacted as strongly as I did. Epic's theory was never one that I thought was terribly strong in this particular context. Given the current record, the court discerns no meaningful difference for digital mobile gaming transactions domestically than globally, and so it chooses, as we talked about in the findings of fact, a global market to evaluate. The court initially assesses Apple's market monopoly power in the relevant product and geographic market before addressing Epic Games' claims under Sections 1 and 2 of the Sherman Act. The the threshold of market power for finding a prima facie case of monopoly power is generally no less than 65% market share. We're using legalese now. Prima facie here means you are assumed to be a monopolist if you hit that number, 65%. Here, we are talking about 57%, which might sound close enough, but it's not. When you're talking about prima facie, you're talking about things that are not abhorrent, but not generally speaking what we want a court to be deciding on because it's essentially a rote threshold that you pass and you decide the question on. So 57% says, no, you're within that area where you're going to have to figure out whether this is a monopoly provided uh, by yourself, your honor. By contrast, section one claims can be satisfied with even less market power. For instance, the Ninth Circuit affirmed a finding of a section one violation where the market share was as low as 24%, but has also found market share above 30% insufficient. And if that sounds unhelpful, that a section one claim might be made at higher than 24%, but also that 30% was not enough in a different case, you're not wrong. Welcome to the world of antitrust law and the mind of a judge and a court, which is going to really be facts and circumstances based in 24, 30, 57, 65. It's all going to be in the eye of the beholder as to how the actors in the particular facts in front of the judge or court are determined for that purpose. So what we've got is a number that doesn't quite rise to the level of monopoly power. It might be good enough for a restraint of trade. And now the court's going to look at that question. As a starting point, the court has found Apple's market share in mobile gaming transaction appears to fluctuate anywhere from approximately 52% to 57% over the course of the three years in evidence. Apple's market share is below the general ranges of where courts found monopoly power under Section 2. And considering direct evidence of monopoly power, Epic Games has failed to demonstrate that there is a necessary restriction in the output of the relevant product. Here, mobile game transactions. With respect to indirect evidence, a more mixed result emerges. A share between 52 and 57% is not high enough to sustain that prima facie case of monopoly, as we just talked about, but is enough to permit the court to evaluate the state and durability of the market. This evaluation includes whether new rivals are barred, whether existing competitors lack the capacity to expand their output, et cetera, et cetera. Bad things happen to competitors at that amount. Here, the evidence is both undeveloped and mixed. In sum, given the totality of the record and its undeveloped state, the court, again, angry at Epic, while the court can conclude that Apple exercises market power in the mobile gaming market, the court cannot conclude that Apple's market power reaches the status of monopoly power in that mobile gaming market. That said, the evidence does suggest that Apple is near the precipice of substantial market power or monopoly power with its considerable market share. And here's a zinger from the court. Apple is only saved by the fact that its share is not higher, that competitors from related submarkets are making inroads into the mobile gaming submarket, and perhaps because plaintiff did not focus on this topic. Wow. Okay, Your Honor. And looking at this, we get this weird sense of editorializing, as we do with Epic. This isn't really one party or the other that's getting this from the judge. But she's finding here that Apple is not a monopolist. And then she's establishing that it's saved by the fact that its share isn't higher. That's that's fair. That's how we determine when a monopoly exists. That competitors are making inroads. Also, how we determine whether someone's a monopolist. And then that Epic didn't focus on it. It's, it's weird exactly what the purpose of these couple of sentences is from the judge, except to exhibit that she's not thrilled with the way Apple operates 
and thinks that there is a very real problem that might be addressable in some other capacity. And, you know, that's neither here nor there. That's fine. Uh, but it is interesting to see in a court document like this one where it doesn't actually impact the decision that the court is making. Uh, although not in the record, the court is further aware that Valve, a major player in the computer gaming market as the owner of the Steam platform, has also announced its own mobile and portable gaming platform. The court does not rely on this fact in reaching its conclusions herein, but only mentions it to further support the court's ultimate conclusion that entries into the mobile gaming submarket appear to be possible and achievable from competitors in related gaming submarkets. Which again, with a paragraph as harsh as this, is just kind of an odd aside. Yeah, people are moving in. The actual industry is in flux. The market percentages are changing. Apple doesn't have a higher share. Competitors can enter. And yet Apple really takes a, a, a brunt of a hit here uh, from the court. And, you know, for, for reasons that are evident when you see how they were, were testifying in the trial, but maybe aren't specifically useful for the legal analysis here. The legal framework for Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Section 1 of the Sherman Act prohibits every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations. Section 1, as we've talked about, is understood to outlaw only unreasonable restraints. So we wind up discussing at length what an unreasonable restraint is, which arrives at the rule of reason. As the Supreme Court recently explained, to determine whether a restraint violates the rule of reason, a three-step burden-shifting framework applies. We already saw this with the fact-finding. Under this framework, the plaintiff has the initial burden to prove that the challenged restraint has a substantial anti-competitive effect that harms consumers in the relevant market. If the plaintiff carries its burden, then the burden shifts to the defendant, Apple, to show a pro-competitive rationale for the restraint. And then if the defendant makes this showing, then the burden shifts back to the plaintiff to demonstrate that the pro-competitive efficiencies could be reasonably achieved through less anti-competitive means. So you got this burden shifting test, it's rule of reason oriented, and it's exactly what the court was doing in its findings of fact. So we basically know how this is going to go already. While the court does not find that the DPLA provides sufficient evidence of an agreement, it nonetheless continues the analysis to inform the issues relating to anti-competitive and incipient antitrust conduct, especially given the anti-steering rules provision therein. Now here is a kind of an interesting aside. I only highlighted this section, but one of the things that's happening is that the DPLA itself as an agreed upon commercial contract might not be sufficient as within one party, not using collusive or other parties in a restraint of trade kind of concept as sufficient to actually having any of this analysis. But the court needs a couple of things to happen. One of which is highlighted at the end of the sentence, which is the court is going to knock down the anti-steering provisions in the app review guidelines. And we said that they would, if you remember way back when to that video that we did in May and at the top of this one. And we said that because it was clear that the court was signaling that they wanted to do that. But one thing that we struggled with, and I mentioned this in a couple of the videos, was if you're going to find that there isn't a monopoly, if the relevant market doesn't give Apple that power, how do you hit that topic if you otherwise want to get at Apple? And, and the court found an interesting way to do so, one of which is just going right by the fact that the agreement itself might not arrive in antitrust rulings. Let's talk about Sherman 1. Here... The court recognizes significant challenges in assessing the anti-competitive effects of the app distribution restrictions. Having carefully considered the evidence, the court does find that the Apple's app distribution restrictions have some anti-competitive effects. Accordingly, Epic Games has put pro-offered both direct and indirect evidence of anti-competitive effects under Section 1. And I apologize for some of the language here. It's an early release of a decision, so there are a few typos uh, in here that will hopefully get cleaned up. Uh, as, as part of the process. Uh, but then we get Apple's pro-competitive justifications, which we know. It's security, it's that kind of thing. Here the court finds Apple's security justification to be a valid and non-protectual business reason for restricting app distribution. So Epic establishes, hey, it might make things cost more for us developers. It might limit games that are in the marketplace. It might do these other things. It might hurt innovation. The court has found that list in the findings of facts. says, yeah, it might do all these things. And now the court says, but Apple says security is a reason, and the court agrees. By providing these protections, Apple provides a safe and trusted user experience on iOS, which encourages both users and developers to transact freely and is mutually beneficial. As a corollary of that security justification, the app distribution restrictions promote interbrand competition. When you see interbrand, think of Google. The Supreme Court has recognized that limiting intrabrand competition can promote interbrand competition. For example, 
Restricting price competition among retailers who sell a particular product can help the manufacturer of that product compete against other manufacturers. It is this interbrand competition that the antitrust laws are designed primarily to protect. Here, and this is important, primarily because it agrees with my thesis from the very top of this series. I'm just joking with you a little bit. Here, centralized app distribution and the walled garden approach differentiates Apple from Google. That distinction ultimately increases consumer choice by allowing users who value open distribution to purchase Android devices, while those who value security and the protection of a walled garden to purchase iOS devices. This too is a legitimate pro-competitive justification. So all of you that came into the comments to my videos and said it was ridiculous for me to assert that you would have a reduction in choice if you got rid of a walled garden model because some people like that walled garden model, you should see the court's language here and understand what I meant by that. That Apple had a different kind of product that was on store shelves. And if you make them all the same, that is lowering consumer choice in a way that you might not like. Hey, you don't care that everything's open because you want everything open. You want some Apple technological expertise, but you want to have the ability to sideload some apps. Don't blame you. I understand that. But some people don't want that. Apple doesn't want to sell you that. And so here the court says, actually, it's pretty useful to have a product line that is different from its nearest competitor. And if that product line being different requires certain intra-brand restrictions on competition, then that might well be okay. Epic Games does not persuasively rebut the security justification, nor shows it to be pretextual. Given the trial record, the court finds that Apple's security rationale is a valid business justification for the app distribution restrictions. As for the intellectual property justification, the specific commission rate is pretextual, as the court previously found. That said, while the court has found the rate itself pretextual, the court cannot conclude that Apple's protection of its intellectual property is pretextual. Apple is entitled to license its intellectual property for a fee and to guard its intellectual property from uncompensated use by others. The restrictions on app distribution on the iOS platform accomplishes that aim, whereas Epic Games' proposed alternatives would weaken it. In short, Epic Games has failed to show that Apple's pro-offered intellectual property justification is protectual as it relates to the restrictions on app distribution. Accordingly, Apple has shown pro-competitive justifications based on the security and the corollary inter-brand competition, as well as generally with respect to intellectual property rights. So if you're keeping score at home, we're talking about Sherman 1, we're talking about restrictions on the distribution of apps. The court says, yeah, Epic might have a point. Some of those have some anti-competitive effects. Uh, Apple might have a point. There's security reasons, there's inter-brand competition, there's intellectual property rep protection. And now Epic gets one last crack at things by trying to propose less restrictive alternatives. Turning to the last step, the parties dispute whether these pro-competitive justifications could be achieved through less restrictive means. Generally, antitrust law does not require business to use anything like the least restrictive means of achieving legitimate business purposes. To the contrary, courts should not second guess degrees of reasonable necessity so that the lawfulness of conduct turns upon judgments of degrees of efficiency. If you're looking at the citations here, God love you, but you'll see the letters NCAA. And if you've also been in virtual legality for a while, you know that we did an Apple video called Why Did Apple Just Submit a Case on College Football? which was the NCAA versus Alston. A number of people asked me about it, including some folks in the journalism sphere. And I said, the reason that they did this was exactly for the reason you're now seeing the court quote. And that was that there was a Supreme Court decision that talked about the rule of reason. And if you looked at that rule of reason language that we went over just a few minutes ago, and you said to yourself, well, if all I have to do is prove that there's a less restrictive means, I have all the time in the world, I'm paying millions of dollars for lawyers. Those lawyers can figure out something that is less restrictive, or at least that is convincing to the judge. The Supreme Court said, yeah, that's right. You could do that with lawyers, but we don't want the courts doing that. We don't want a court evaluating, second guessing here, you see referenced, exactly what was decided. So if there's something wildly less competitive, if it's obviously so, you can win on a rule of reason analysis. If it's marginally, you have to convince the court, you've got expensive lawyers doing it for you, the court doesn't want to be in the business of making these decisions. And Alston put forth a bunch of quotes that were talking about that specifically. And Apple wound up submitting the Alston case when it came down this summer in an effort to say, court, think about this. You don't want us to lose on a rule of reason analysis and you to disagree with the Supreme Court on this question. And it's interesting to me to look at all these sections, Apple's gonna win all of them, and say Alston is really strongly pushing for 
the results that the court wound up putting forth here. And one does wonder if this section or the thought process of the court looked different at all before Alston came down, because that was very strong language the Supreme Court used. And it wouldn't surprise me if big sections, big swaths of these sections changed after Alston came down. However, the court continues, missing from both the enterprise and notarization models that Epic put forth is human app review which provides most of the protection against privacy violations, human fraud, and social engineering. In evaluating remedies, no court should, Alston again, impose a duty that it cannot explain or adequately and reasonably supervise. In short, Epic Games has not met its burden to show that its proposed alternatives are virtually as effective as the current distribution model and can be implemented without significantly increased cost. Accordingly, the court finds that Apple's app distribution restrictions do not violate Section 1 of the Sherman Act. So that's Apple's first win. Epic Games has then presented some direct and indirect evidence showing that Apple's IAP functionality has had anti-competitive effects. Apple has pro-offered more than three competitive justifications for the terms of the agreement relating to the IAP. One, IAP is the mechanism by which Apple can easily receive its commission. Two, IAP provides consumers with a unitary, safe, and secure means to execute transactions. And third, IAP offers consumers a centralized purchasing system. At step three, where Epic has to show alternatives, Epic Games has identified no suitable, less restrictive alternative for Apple's use of IAP based on the current record. Even in the absence of IAP, here comes our quotes again, Apple could still charge a commission on developers. It would simply be most difficult for Apple to collect that commission. This is deemed by the court to be the most significant use of IAP. It's the method by which Apple collects its licensing fee. And the court finds that to be a good reason and justifiably so. Indeed, while the court finds no basis for the specific rate chosen by Apple, the court still concludes that Apple is entitled to some compensation. The requirement of usage of IAP accomplishes this goal in the easiest and most direct manner, whereas Epic Games' only proposed alternative would severely undermine it. Indeed, to the extent Epic Games suggests that Apple received nothing from in-app purchases made on its platform, such a remedy is inconsistent with prevailing intellectual property law. Epic is just wrong. Second, if Apple could no longer require developers to use IIP for digital transactions, Apple's competitive advantage on security issues in the broad sense would be undermined. Thus, the court concludes that Apple's restrictions as to its IAP and separate payment processors do not violate Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Apple's prohibition on outside payment processing is not a violation of the antitrust laws. And that is important. <laughs> All those headlines that we read to start this video about Apple being forced to put on other processors in in-app payment processing, that, 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 that's not happening because Apple isn't wrong, according to the court, in prohibiting other payment processing from happening within its space. Epic Games brings two claims under Section 2 arguing monopoly maintenance. Count 1 is based on its theory of the iOS distribution market, and Count 4 is based on the iOS in-app payment solutions market. So Section 2 of the Sherman Act, Section 1 was restraints of trade. Section 2 is your monopoly provision. It prohibits persons from monopolizing or attempting to monopolize or combining or conspiring with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations. A claim for unlawful monopolization under Section 2 requires a plaintiff to show the possession of monopoly power, makes sense, the willful acquisition or maintenance of that power, and antitrust injury. Remember, this is one of the very first things that we talked about in this space. Monopoly of itself is not illegal. The United States antitrust laws do not penalize success, successful competition especially. So if you just went about your business and you wound up with 90% market share, that's fine. If you did something unreasonable to maintain that 90% or to acquire that 90%, you caused antitrust injury, you caused injury to competition, that's when the court swings in to get you. Just being a monopoly, not illegal. In count one, Epic Games claims that Apple has a monopoly and has unlawfully maintained the monopoly by prohibiting iOS app developers from distributing their apps through alternative channels. In short, the court says this claim fails for two significant reasons. One, Epic Games failed to prove the first element that Apple has monopoly power. And two, Epic Games alternatively fails to satisfy the rule of reason analysis that we just talked about with respect to section one, which is a less exacting test than is what is required for section two. Epic Games did not argue that Apple had monopoly power in the market of global mobile gaming transactions. And while we can be mad at Epic if we're on Epic's side of a court case like this, very difficult to predict that the judge is going to decide that global mobile gaming transactions is the relevant market. So, you know, Epic did its best. As demonstrated with respect to the relevant market, Apple does not have substantial market power equating to monopoly power. 
And alternatively, Epic Games' Section 2 claims fail to satisfy the rule of reason analysis for the reasons we just talked about above. The claim about in-app payment solutions fails for the same reason. The tying claim is going to fail, as we talked about, because they're not distinct products. Epic Games' claim fails under either framework because a tying claim cannot be sustained where the alleged good is not that separate product. Here, as there, IAP is but one component of the full suite of services offered by iOS and the App Store. A lot of people came in to discuss with me the Epic theory that IAP was distinct from the app, was distinct from the iOS. I said, well, it's, it's a hardware unitary solution that Apple wants to sell out into the marketplace. Court basically bought that. It says, you can't have a tying claim. IAP isn't separate. There isn't a market. They're not licensing it. They're not selling it. And Bob's your uncle. Moreover, with respect to consumer demand, Epic Games has presented no evidence showing that demand exists for IAP as a standalone product. As discussed above, Epic Games' argument mischaracterizes IAP and its functionality. Payment processing is simply an input into the larger bundle of services provided by IAP. While there may be a market for payment processing, the fact is irrelevant, as IAP is not just payment processing. Then we move over to California. If you go back earlier in this series, you'll see me skip a lot of the California stuff. It's basically the same as the Sherman Act, and you'll see that for most of these counts. Epic Games asserts three claims against Apple under the Cartwright Act. Count seven for unreasonable restraint in trade, count eight for unreasonable restraint of trade in the in-app payment solutions market, and count nine for tying of app distribution and payment processing. The court can skip almost all of this. Epic Games argues that even if its claims under the Sherman Act fail, it is nevertheless entitled to relief under the California law. Apple disagrees, arguing that whereas here Epic Games has not identified any specific and material differences between the California law and the Sherman Act, plaintiff cannot prevail on the California law where its claims fail under the Sherman Act. And the court agrees. Everything we just said, that Apple's not a monopolist, it lo you lose on Sherman 1, you lose on Sherman 2, you lose on tying, it all applies to the California law. And then we get to essential facility, which if you're really paying close attention, you know the judge actually started pinging the counsel about in the middle of the trial saying, why aren't you talking to me about essential facility? The judge throws it out here for every reason why lawyers won't talk about it in the trial setting. The legal elements of an essential facility claim under governing Ninth Circuit precedent are undisputed. To establish such a claim, a plaintiff must show that the defendant is a monopolist in control of an essential facility. The plaintiff is unable reasonably or practically to duplicate that facility. The defendant has refused to provide the plaintiff with access to that facility, and it is feasible for the defendant to provide such access. The court finds that Epic Game has failed to prove this claim for myriad reasons. Always good to see. But most convincingly for two. Epic Games has failed to prove that Apple is an illegal monopolist. Yep. When you made that finding a fact that Apple wasn't a monopolist, a lot of this cascades away. Epic Games also failed to prove that the iOS platform is an essential facility. Essential facility carries a specific definition, and you could always make your own phone, basically. Based on these reasons, the Section 2 claim based on an essential facility theory fails. And now we get to where the rubber hits the road if you're Epic Games and how you get so many headlines saying Epic Games had a big win. As the judge says, antitrust law does not end with the Sherman Act. California's unfair competition law prohibits business practices that constitute unfair competition. Good name for the law then. Which is defined in relevant part as any unlawful, unfair, or fraudulent business act or practice. You probably find that definition to be as unuseful as I do, but thankfully the court is going to discuss what it means. Here, Apple does not dispute Epic Games' standing as a potential competitor. Epic Games wanted to open a competing iOS game store and could not. So now we talk about unlawful practices and unfair practices. Under the unlawful prong of the UCL, Epic Games must show that Apple's conduct can properly be called a business practice and that at the same time, it is forbidden by law. Here, for all the reasons we just mentioned for 180 pages, Epic Games has not shown a violation of any other law. Accordingly, the claim under the unlawful standard fails. But now we get into the equitable type of situation. The unfair prong of the UCL may differ for consumer and competitor suits. As a competitor who claims to have suffered injury from Apple's unfair practices, Epic Games must show that Apple's conduct threatens an incipient violation of antitrust law. You gotta love incipient. You use that in your regular uh, everyday life? Basically meaning you're on the precipice of committing an antitrust law violation violates the policy or spirit of one of those laws because its effects are comparable to or the same as a violation of the law or otherwise significantly threatens 
or harms competition. As a quasi-consumer, on the other hand, Epic Games has several tests available for showing unfairness. Although some courts have continued to apply the tethering test stated above, others have applied a balancing test that requires the challenge business practice to be immoral, unethical, oppressive, unscrupulous, or substantially injurious to consumers based on the court's weighing of a number of factors. So that first test is called the tethering test. The court finds it to be useful. Unfair practices under this test are not limited to violations of existing law. The UCL itself, the court finds, is providing another avenue for finding something illegal. Here, Epic Games seeks relief for the same conduct that it challenged under the Sherman and Cartwright Acts. Apple argues that separate consideration under the UCL is inappropriate. The court disagrees. Celtech, a precedent, expressly recognizes that incipient violations of antitrust laws and violations of the policy or spirit of those laws with comparable effects are prohibited. Now, if you're familiar with me here in virtual legality at all, you know, this is one of the kinds of things that bothers me when we're talking about terms of service or terms of conditions. You look at things like the YouTube terms, the Google terms, or I think maybe even the Twitch terms that have things like, we can take these actions as if you defaulted or breached your contract if we think you got close enough. And to that, I always say, well, if you think something's a problem, you should write the rules very specifically. You should set the lines black and white so I know where the line is. And if it's just, I got close enough, then it's all entirely within your power to decide what is going to cause me trouble. Here in California, the UCL here is doing that same work. It says, hmm, you almost violated the law. And we think that there are comparable effects to if you had. And so we're going to give the judges of our jurisdiction power to find things about them. As I said earlier in this video, we knew the court wanted to hit the anti-steering rule stuff. So here's how she's doing it. And I think this is the type of decision-making, equitable California law applied nationwide, that is going to be the, the most likely to, to suffer at an appeal. You're going to have a lot of differing opinions as to how this kind of analysis works because it isn't black letter law. It isn't kind of analysis of existing precedent. Continuing with her decision here, on the present record, however, Epic Games' claims based on the app distribution and in-app payment processing restrictions fail for the same reasons as stated for the Sherman Act. To a large extent, that makes the conduct more than not anti-competitive, but potentially beneficial to consumers. Epic Games did challenge and litigate the anti-steering provisions, albeit the record was less fulsome. While its strategy of seeking broad sweeping relief failed, narrow remedies are not precluded. Which is an interesting way of saying, if you were following along at home, when Epic's filed its big lawsuit, it really wasn't aimed at the anti-steering language. But you don't know what you don't know with what's going to work for a judge, and you did know it by the time you were in the middle of the trial. So the court is saying, well, Epic didn't aim at that, but it did talk to us about it. And so we can make a narrow decision, even though we're going to tell them to pound sand on the bulk of what they argued. It says, Apple's own records reveal that two of the top three most effective marketing activities to keep existing users coming back in the United States and therefore increasing revenues are push notifications and email outreach. Apple not only controls those avenues, but acts anti-competitively by blocking developers from using them to Apple's own unrestrained gain. As explained before, Apple uses anti-steering provisions prohibiting apps from including buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct consumers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase, and from encouraging users to use a purchasing method other than in-app purchase, either within the app or through communications sent to points of contact obtained from account registrations within the app. Thus, developers cannot communicate lower prices on other platforms either within iOS or to users obtained from the iOS platform. Apple's general policy also prevents developers from informing users of its 30% commission, which I didn't see in the guidelines. You see referenced here as part of trial testimony and depositions, and that's Apple shooting itself in, the own, in their own foot. You should always be allowed to tell folks what your commissions are in that structure, but Apple apparently was preventing people from doing that. These provisions can be severed. They can be separated from the rest of the guidelines and the rules and the contracts without any impact on the integrity of the ecosystem and is tethered to legislative policy. So that tethering rule requires you to have something within California that the California legislature has expressed that it's trying to do that you want to tie your UCL ruling to. And here the court's going to find that it's antitrust rules in general. While Epic Games did not meet its burden to show actual lock-in on the record, didn't win the Sherman claim, the Supreme Court has recognized that such information costs may create the potential for anti-competitive exploitation of consumers. Thus, although Epic Games has not proven a present antitrust violation, the anti-steering provisions 
threaten an incipient violation of an antitrust law by preventing informed choice among users of the iOS platform. Moreover, the anti-steering provisions violate the policy and spirit of these laws because anti-steering has the effect of preventing substitution among platforms for transactions. Accordingly, the court finds that the anti-steering provisions violate the UCL's unfair prong under the tethering test. So you got a California law says unfair business practices are illegal. The court goes through this process, says, yeah, it's not a violation of the antitrust laws. It's not a violation of the California antitrust laws, but super, super close. And so we're going to use the UCL to say that it's illegal under that tethering concept. And if that sounds unique to you, it is. It's a kind of California concept. It's the kind of thing that will be evaluated uh, by other courts, most definitely. In terms of the balancing test, remember Epic could also win on a balancing test type argument. The harm to users and developers who are also quasi-consumers is considerable. Apple has not offered any justification for its actions other than to argue entitlement. But where its actions harm competition and result in super competitive pricing and profits, Apple is wrong. It's just what the court says. And so Apple is left losing this portion of the case. While Apple's conduct does not fall within the confines of traditional antitrust law, the conduct falls within the purview of an incipient antitrust violation with particular anti-competitive practices which have not been justified. In terms of balancing, Apple's business justifications focus on other parts of the Apple ecosystem and will not be significantly impacted by the increase of information to and choice for consumers. Now understand, one of the things the court is saying here is that this is a narrow ruling that isn't going to do what The Verge says, isn't going to put a serious dent in Apple's $19 billion app store business, that their business justifications will not be significantly impacted by the increase of information, that it's entirely designed to be narrow. And part of the reason you see all these quotes about the fact that the court is very specifically not saying that Epic Games just gets to skip out on paying anything to Apple is because they know they're making a decision that could be read in the way that the journalists are reading it today. While the court has defined the relevant market for antitrust purposes as the market for mobile gaming transactions, UCL jurisprudence does not require that the court import that market limitation. The court cannot discern any principled reason for eliminating the anti-steering provisions to mobile gaming only, the lack of information and transparency extends to all apps, not just gaming apps. So now you have an expansion. The court has found that what Epic has fought Apple on is a monopoly power within a specific subset of the marketplace, specifically mobile gaming on a global basis. Now the court says, but your anti-steering rules apply to everybody and are equally anti-competitive, even though there's no analysis of anti-competitiveness done with respect to those other markets. And... Again, I look at this as a situation where Apple clearly said some stuff, clearly reported some things, clearly did some arbitrary and capricious stuff that got under the judge's skin. And he, this is the result. And this is the way that she has decided to justify the elimination of the anti-steering rules when she had signaled that for the better part of the last week of the trial. Apple argues that any equitable relief issued under state law, presumably including under the UCL, must be limited to California to avoid a violation of the Commerce Clause. The U.S. Constitution says that the federal government shall control interstate commerce and the states can't really control it at a state level. The Commerce Clause precludes the application of a state statute to commerce that takes place wholly outside of the state's borders, whether or not the commerce has effects within the state. Here, neither the conduct at issue nor its effects are taking place wholly outside of California. Apple is headquartered in California. The DPLA is governed by California law and the commerce affected by the conduct that the court has found to be unfair takes place at least in part in California. By the same token, however, Epic Games provides the court with no authority that an injunction could issue globally based upon a violation of California's UCL, which is how the court arrives at a nationwide injunction. Now, taking this apart a little bit, we just talked about this in other court cases that are pretty prominent in California. One of the ways that they get Apple here is that they're headquartered in California and they've chosen to be governed by California law in their contracts. This is the kind of thing, the kind of ruling that has a company evaluate its decision-making on these bases. Not a lot of states have the same concept as the unfair competition law in California, not in the United States. There might be other jurisdictions around the world. And so while I think the court is correct to say, hey, you're headquartered here, we can enforce our rules against you. You said your contract is governed by California law. We can enforce your rules against you there. It does seem to me like the most likely version of an appeal by Apple is, yes, none of this is applicable. The judge made a mistake in enforcing the UCL in this fashion, but also 
even if you allow her to enforce it in this fashion. A nationwide injunction doesn't make sense. Michigan hasn't said anything about this particular law. Iowa, Indiana, Nebraska, Florida, Texas, New York, whatever you want, hasn't said anything that lines up with California's UCL. So the argument is, how can California then change the way a global, but at least national company operates across state lines? And I think Apple might find some purchase with an argument like that. In terms of the injunction itself, the judge says a nationwide injunction shall issue enjoining Apple from prohibiting developers to include in their apps any apps and their metadata, buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms in addition to IAP, nor may Apple prohibit developers from communicating with customers through points of contact obtained voluntarily from customers through account registration within the app. And a number of people come out and said, well, what in the world does that mean? How did the court arrive at that language? What is external links, etc." And the only thing I could tell you is that the court took the language from the app review guidelines and said, this sentence here has to go away. 3.1.1, apps and their metadata may not include buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. What it doesn't change is the sentence at the start of this section. If you want to unlock features or functionality within your app, you must use in-app purchase. And that gets modified for multi-platform games and things down here, but Apple could look at any of these things and change them. In fact, the language that the court cites for 3.1.3 doesn't even exist anymore after the changes that Apple made in Cameron. They already say developers can send communications outside of the app to their user base about purchasing methods other than in-app purchase here. So it's a little bit confused in terms of an injunction, but what it definitely doesn't do is it doesn't say that Apple can't prevent you from putting your in-app payment processing directly in your app. You can now have a button and a link and a call to action that sends people out of the app and presumably sends them back. But it doesn't say anything about putting a processor in the app itself. And again, the court has reiterated time and time again that it believes that Apple is owed some money for having access to the store and its intellectual property. So all of the readings that go further than that are wrong. Then we get to Epic's loss, right? Epic, we know, performed this hot fix surreptitiously. We know it annoyed the court. We know they said they could breach it because the whole darn contract was illegal and they were self-righteous and they knew that they were fighting for glory in America and apple pie or whatever it might be. By the time you get here to section seven of this decision, you know that Epic is lost. Epic is not going to win its Sherman Act claims, is not going to win its antitrust claims in California. It won an anti-steering injunction, which we could have predicted a couple of months ago. In fact, we did, but its breach is now not justified. As the court finds, plaintiff has admitted that it breached the DPLA in the manner that Apple alleges and that Apple is entitled to relief on its counterclaim for breach of contract to the extent that the court finds that the DPLA is enforceable. Epic tries to say it's illegal. As discussed above, the court has found and concluded that no provision of the DPLA at issue in the action is unlawful under the Sherman Act or the Cartwright Act, and only one unrelated provision is under the UCLA, UCL. While the court has found that evidence suggests Apple's 30% rate of commission appears inflated and is potentially anti-competitive, See, they just keep throwing these in. Epic Games did not challenge the rate. Rather, Epic Games challenged the imposition of any commission whatsoever, which is never going to win you the day. The court is not persuaded by Epic Games' broad brush argument that it should not be bound by certain portions of the agreement. The DPLA provisions related to the breaching conduct arising from Project Liberty were not found to be invalid. Even though the court has found that anti-steering provisions to be unfair under the UCL, the result was a measured alternative to plaintiff's overreach. These provisions can be severed while maintaining the provisions that require honesty to control the party's relations in the coding of apps. Epic Games never adequately explained its rush to the courthouse or the actual need for clandestine tactics. The marketing campaign appears to have resulted in indirect benefits, but it does not provide a legal defense. In California, where a single contract provision is invalid, but the balance of the contract is lawful, the invalid provision is severed and the balance of the contract is enforced. The court finds and concludes that Epic Games has not shown that the DPLA is unconscionable. A contractual term is not unconscionable unless it is found to be both procedurally and substantively unconscionable. Here, the absence of substantive unconscionability is dispositive. These are billion and trillion dollar companies with a business dispute. Epic Games itself uses adhesion contracts. As noted, plaintiff has admitted that it breached the DPLA as Apple alleges and has conceded that if the court finds that the breach provisions of the DPLA are enforceable against Epic, then Apple would be entitled to relief as a result of the breach. 
Because Apple's breach of contract claim is also premised on violations of DPLA provisions independent of the anti-steering provisions, the court finds and concludes in light of the plaintiff's admissions and concessions that Epic Games has breached these provisions of the DPLA and that Apple is entitled to relief for these violations. Also rejects any violations of good faith and fair dealing because it's got a breach. Unjust enrichment doesn't need to find either because it's got that hard breach. And then finds, interestingly, for a lawyer, that the indemnification provision does not afford Apple attorney's fees on the breach because the provision itself does not specifically state that it applies to parties to the contract. And so the court reads in an application only to third-party litigations. You can bet Apple will fix that in the next revision of their developer terms. And the court finds and concludes that Apple has not shown that it is entitled to recover those attorney's fees. At the end of the day, then, the case does not involve retaliation, Epic Games never showed why it had to breach its agreements to challenge the conduct litigated. It merely enforced the rights as plaintiff's own internal documents show Epic Games expected. So the remedies to which Apple is entitled is that to which Epic Games stipulated in the event that the court found it liable for breach of contract, namely damages in an amount equal to 30% of the $12.1 million in revenue Epic Games collected from users in the Fortnite app on iOS through direct payment between August and October of 2020, plus 30% of any such revenue Epic Games collected from November 1st, 2020 through the date of judgment. Understand, Apple isn't processing anything for Epic for those numbers. Apple is just owed the 30% that they otherwise agreed to receive under the contract with Epic Games. That's what the court is doing here. And Epic now owes four some odd million dollars to Apple for the trouble. Epic also gets against it a declaration that Apple's termination of the DPLA and the related agreements between Epic and Apple was valid, lawful, and enforceable, and that Apple has the contractual right to terminate its DPLA with any or all of Epic Games' wholly owned subsidiaries, affiliates, and or other entities under Epic Games' control at any time and at Apple's sole discretion. So for those of you asking me the question when this first came out, yes, Fortnite can be kept off of the iOS. Apple could also terminate all Epic accounts, including those accounts related to servicing Unreal Engine. That was prevented by preliminary injunction last year. And now we're looking at a situation where if Apple really wanted to be the bad guy, and I don't think they would do this, they could terminate those Unreal accounts, tell Epic to pound sand, and never add them back to the game store as it stands today. So when you read those headlines, you say Epic is a big winner here. You have to really analyze what exactly that anti-steering win means, especially when Apple can still get its 30% cut at least until that's modified, as the court seriously wants done with its number of references to the fact that it doesn't necessarily believe the 30% is justified. But as of right now, Epic has lost four plus million dollars, its own attorney's fees, and Apple has the right to terminate its entire relationship with them due to its clandestine tactics. As the court finds, ultimately Epic Games overreached. Thus, and in summary, the court does not find that Apple is an antitrust monopolist, in the submarket for mobile gaming transactions. However, it does find that Apple's conduct in enforcing anti-steering restrictions is anti-competitive. Technically, it finds it as unfair in California, but we'll allow it. Moreover, it does not require the court to micromanage business operations, which courts are not well suited to do, as the Supreme Court has appropriately recognized. See, the court's here trying to get in front of the fact that Apple's going to say you're you're legislating from the bench by changing our anti-steering rules. You're using a California rule in a way that it isn't designed to do. You've already said we're not in violation. We're not monopolist, etc. cetera. So the court here is trying to establish that under Alston and the other language that we looked at, that it's doing something that isn't necessary to be micromanaged and telling the circuit court of appeals and potentially the Supreme Court that it feels that this adjudication is appropriate for what's in front of it. The preliminary injunction previously ordered is terminated, which puts Unreal Engine and the rest of Epic's accounts at risk. And that's the decision. Now, we do have some responses from some folks, including Apple. Today, the court has affirmed that we've known all along the App Store is not in violation of antitrust law. As the court recognized, success is not illegal. Apple faces rigorous competition in every segment in which we do business. And we believe customers and developers choose us because our products and services are the best in the world. We remain committed to ensuring the App Store is a safe and trusted marketplace that supports a thriving developer community and more than 2.1 million U.S. jobs and where the rules apply equally to everyone. And that can sound as so much smoke. Obviously, Apple is public relations designed to throw smoke, but even Tim Sweeney doesn't follow with the journalistic headlines. Today's ruling isn't a win for developers or for consumers. Epic is fighting for fair competition among in-app payment methods and app stores for a billion consumers. Fortnite will return to the iOS App Store when and where Epic can offer in-app payment in fair competition with Apple in-app payment. 
passing along the savings to consumers. Thanks to everyone who put so much time and effort into the battle over fair competition on digital platforms. And thanks especially to the court for managing a very complex case on a speedy timeline. We will fight on. And as I said, I expect fully Apple will appeal, Epic will appeal. The judge in this case knew that both would appeal in all likelihood unless there was a complete decision on one side, in which case the other side would appeal. And so this was always destined for at least the appellate court system and potentially even more. But as it stands right now, as we talked about last May, as we've talked about for 50 plus episodes now, 18 in just the trial itself, this is a case that Epic always had a very tall hill to climb to win. They failed to climb that hill, much to the consternation in certain important respects by all look of things, to the court and to the judge herself. And now we're looking at a situation where you're going to get probably a hold on them, on Apple having to change its anti-steering rules until we get even further into Epic versus Apple and the rest of the appellate process. If you survived to the two and a half hour mark of this video, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who has participated in this series from its very start, including Tim Sweeney and Epic. Couldn't have done it without you. So I very much appreciate this very interesting topic. If you like discussions about the law and business of technology, video games, mobile systems, antitrust, and all the rest, please do consider supporting the channel. We can't do it without the support of all you. We've got a Patreon. We've got other ways to support the channel listed in the description to the video. But if you don't want to do that, can't hardly blame you. Just subscribing, telling your friends that we're having these conversations, upvoting, downvoting. Maybe you think they're an hour two. I really lost track of the plot. You want to tell me about it in a comment? Do that. Give me that downvote. Give me that comment. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to have those discussions because reasonable minds can differ. And I think we've got a lot of reasonable minds in this community. If you caught this on YouTube, God love you. Thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it instead as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will, after taking a long break after this one, catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.